Good morning, everybody, and welcome uh, to the Oregon Housing Stability Council meeting for the month of November. We have just opened up our virtual meeting room. We've got uh, more than 50 people online right now. The numbers rapidly climbing once things settle down and we look like we're at a stable number. We will formally convene the meeting. Thank you all for joining us today. All right, we do have a quorum now. So at this time, I would like to formally convene the Oregon Housing Stability Council on November 3rd, 2023. And this is an exciting day for us on the council. We are going to be back up to full strength with the appointment of three new council members, Margaret Harris, Aaron Meehan, and Christy Rodriguez. And Following public comment, uh, I want to provide an opportunity for each one of them to introduce themselves to the council and our audience. So can we, and incidentally, the three of them are joining us today as observers, and they're welcome to participate in the discussion, but they will formally be voting members as of our December meeting. All right, can we have the roll call, please? Thank you, Chair Hall. Council Member Defantorum. Present. Council Member Farrell. Here. Chair Hall. Present. Council Member Lee. Here. Council Member Mena. Here. Council Member Rogers. Present. Council Member Harris. Present. Council Member Meehan. I'm here. Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Council Members. We do have quorum. We begin the meeting as we always do with public comment. People are welcome to offer up to three minutes of public testimony to the Council. And we will start off with the 10 people who signed up in advance for testimony. And after that, we will have an opportunity uh, for people who haven't requested or signed up to offer their uh, comments. So we'll start off. Uh, first person signed up is Sarah Gearhart. Sarah, I do not see your name on the list. If you're calling in by phone only, please use the raise hand function, star nine. I do not have Sarah on the line just yet. Okay, let's try Neil Whitaker. Respected members of the council and Director Bell, I have a few questions about the OHCS inspection of milepost five from this year. It shows tenant occupancy at 64%, and we were told that needed to be above 80% for the tax credits. And in this inspection, there are 15 of 62 units where uh, there's a comment that reads, tenant application prior to move in was not found in the file. Love to know more about that. And two units where tenant background check was not found in the file. OHCS did appear to look at past tenant history in around a dozen specific units. 
And this list is identical to the list of units you were alerted to throughout 2022. And we are familiar with the felons that were on leases in a number of these. Uh, unfortunately, your review somehow did not find them. It, I've mentioned this before in the public record, OHCS asked Guardian about the sodomy one felon. Got a, Guardian admits to OHCS that this felon was indeed on a lease. OHCS looked at the past tenant file for this specific unit and somehow did not find him. Would, I would like a little clarification there. Given what Milepost 5 has experienced, compliance regulations critical to tenant safety are only monitored, not monitored proactively and only enforced, actually not even enforced when violations are uncovered by the public. You didn't prevent ineligible felons from being rented to. And then you allowed the property manager and the owner to ignore concerns about essentially what was armed drug crime for years. Any consequences then that might inspire a proper professional response the next time this happens were not applied here. There are clear requirements for LIHTC criminal background screening, but OHCS is incapable of finding felons even when victims point directly to unit numbers. I'm not sure that we can afford to have this kind of fail up model where aggressive failures are also then rewarded with more money in terms of public funds. Chronic negligence on this scale on the taxpayer dime is not really sustainable for any city, let alone Portland right now. And how I'm puzzled as to how the millions dumped in the top are not creating anything remotely close to safe, clean conditions for the tenants. An article I sent you on Rockwood Village that it went from ribbon cutting essentially to overburdening Gresham police in less than six months. I'd like to hear more about that. The public record shows that CDP has a strong interest in converting to permanent supportive housing and we'd like to know how does that work with your public face of returning it to an arts community. Due to the reputation created by all of this mess, the studios now has a building with unsecured doors that has the reputation as amenable to drug use and it really does need 24 hour security. That is kind of my main point in all this blather today, you need to install 24 hour security that I think that's the least you can do after the just huge number of violations you found. Okay, we're past three minutes. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. That's all. Rick Solon. Rick, are you there? I do not see Rick logged on. How about Whitley Sullivan? I don't have a Whitney yet. Okay. Lynn Browning. Go ahead, Lynn. Lynn, can you hear us? You're on mute, Lynn. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Lynn and I live at Mile Post 5. And I was going to talk to you guys about um, asking OHCS to have CDP pay for 24 hour, 24 7 security, excuse me, um, at the building because of. Um, yeah, because of the drugs and the broken doors and the broken windows and yeah, just all of that. Um, are you still there? Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Amber Cook. I do not have Amber Cook online yet. Barbara Geyer. No Barbara yet. Oh, one, wait, one attendance raised their hand. Perhaps this is via phone only. One moment. Go ahead, please. Hi, this is Amber.
Can you hear me? Uh, no, your signal really seems to be fading out and then coming back slightly and then fading again. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Um, okay, now it's a so consistent. It's, okay. It's a little better. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, and... Are you ready to begin? Sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. This is my first time doing this by phone. I apologize. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Um, um, uh, good morning, Chair Hall and members of the Housing Stability Council. Welcome new members. Uh, my name is Amber Cook, um, calling in from Milepost 5 as member of the um, Milepost 5 Tenant Council. And I want to say um, Milepost 5 is being filled up with chronically homeless with no supportive services. CDP has, has to make a final real decision. Will there be artist preference or supportive housing and pay for the support those tenants need? We the artists, we wanna do art. We wanna be an artist community, but we won't unless the building is finally secured. The artist workshop returned to us, community art funded by CDP at least initially. There are three doors and six ground floor windows unsecured right now. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> so, to, so to secure this building, we want from CDP in writing 24-7 security to close the daily 13-hour gap for at least a year, you know, fix all the doors and the windows, finally, no more delays. <laughs> um, and in the future, all door and window fixes take place within 72 hours, not months, um, and pay for the security cam footage used to remove all trespassers and exclude them. CDP has the opportunity to restore what they ruined. They can provide a city treasure rather than a neighborhood nuisance property. Spend some of the profits and you'll get a fully rented property with long-term renters and attention getting artists like it was before you took it over. Everyone giving testimony for Milepost 5 last month, ask OE to stay behind and push for 24 seven security and a secured property because this and I don't know what else to call it, but a nuisance property has to finally be run as livable low-income housing. We heard nothing back to our very important and game-changing ask the entire month. So we're asking you, respectively, the executive directors of OHCS and the Affordable Housing Division, Andrea Bell and Natasha Detwaller-D, to respond to it during the meeting, this meeting, this month because it's long past time for OHS to communicate with the renters and the neighbors and that we start getting direct answers and effective help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Barbara Geyer online now? No. Okay, how about Darby Ayers Flood? Good morning, thank you. Uh, and uh, good morning to Chair Hall and members of the council. Uh, my name is Darby Ayers Flood. I serve the city of talent as mayor. Um, I want to offer some special thanks to Mary Farrell for her representation of Southern Oregon. It is important as many here are still very much in fire recovery. I'm here today with a respectful reminder that too many talent residents remain in transitional housing, losing hope with every day that passes after near 38 months since the Almeida fire. I speak for my constituents in talent that we are very grateful to OHCS for your partnership on the Gateway Transitional Housing Project, still very much in use and at capacity. It was early this week that I ran into a member of the Reyes family who once lived at Talent Mobile Estates. TME, TME as locals call it, is where Casa of Oregon and Coalition Fortaleza still are working very hard to get this key housing for recovery reoccupied to bring our families back home. The family members spoke about their struggles and the struggles of other families who are still waiting to return home to the talent mobile estates, leaving the cramped RV trailers behind that they believed were meant to be temporary. I can't tell you how painful it is to watch beloved members of one's own community languish in unsuitable short-term housing, seeing the loss of hope on their faces that resettlement may never really happen. I would also like to share that the City of Talent stopped an affordable housing project at the Gateway site 
that was progressing pre-fire in order to partner with OHCS for transitional housing to bring families home in the aftermath of the Almeda fire. Fire survivor families were living in donated used trailers at county and state parks designed for campers. And like you all, we wanted to get our neighbors back home while they waited to be resettled at Talent Mobile Estates. So you see, talent needs Talent Mobile Estates to be completed so that we can resettle our families from the gateway to the Talent Mobile Estates. Only then can we resume our four acre affordable housing project at Gateway that will provide additional affordable housing stock. Thank you for considering my comments and your planning processes. Again, Talent is grateful for our partnership and fire recovery with OHCS, but there is still a long way to go and hope is waning. We ask that OHCS remains very focused on Talent Mobile Estates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Cobain. Hello. Hello. Is this Sarah? Hi. Yes. Go uh, ahead, please. Hello, council members. Um, I am a tenant at Mile Post 5, and I just wanted to request and echo what others have said, that we do, in fact, need 24-hour security here to repair the relationship between the building and the community because the, it's still out of control. Um, even in some hours with security, there's not enough security to deal with the issues on hand. And they're going from one event to another event, um, just one after another. So, we still have several tenants that make the building a hub of drug sales and free showers to their friends and clients. And the police response has been terrible because of the fractured relationship this building has with them from not pressing charges and previous management kind of cementing that relationship. So I understand that is a hurdle, but it is one that we must cross because this is it's untenable to be you know, at this point me going into my second year of living here and it's basically the same with new microwaves um i do feel like current management is listening to us better but it feels as though their hands are tied we desperately need 24 hour security here Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Is Emily Newton online? Go ahead, Emily, you're on mute. There you go. Hi, I'm here. Um, good morning, my name's Emily. I am here to give public testimony uh, about the Milepost 5 building. I am a member of the community and a direct neighbor. I've lived in this community for coming up to four years and um, the majority of the time we have been dealing with issue after issue with the Milepost 5 building due to lack of oversight and management. And again, I'm here month after month to give public testimony about the experience and to uh, request that OHCS put pressure on CDP, who quote unquote owns and runs the Milepost 5 building. Uh, we continue to see trespassers on the property at all hours of the morning, uh, including known criminals such as uh, Harold Davis Jr. who ran the armed drug window uh, di directly across from my house uh, for months. CDP did nothing uh, to stop this and continues to do nothing to um, discontinue the sex trafficking, the selling drugs and other criminal activity in the building. As you've heard from the other um, people who have given testimony, people who live in the building that show up month after month to give testimony, nothing is being done about this. Um, I'm here to request that you put pressure on CDP to hire 24 seven security um, to deal with these problems. There needs to be security on site at all times. 
you need to put pressure on CDP to commit to fixing all unsecured entrances and windows, uh, three unsecured doors and six unsecured floor access windows is completely unacceptable to people who are paying rent and uh, this is their home. Uh, these repairs need to be uh, repaired within 72 hours of, of having them um, in disrepair. Again, completely unacceptable. Uh, CDP also needs to be um, required to legally trespass any of the trespassers returning to the building. As I mentioned before, uh, people coming in and using the building for sex trafficking and selling drugs is completely unacceptable within somebody else's home. Okay, you say that you want to centre tenants' voices. You've heard the tenants. You've received the emails. So it is your responsibility uh, as the person who is the over, overseeing CDP and giving them money to, to, make, to make these changes. Uh, from the outside, we're seeing more and more cars stopping on our street to go inside and get something, uh, AKA drugs, and to return their cars to, uh, to use. Yesterday, I witnessed a man stumble out of the building. Excuse me, we're past him. three minutes now, but thank you for your input. Uh, we'll try one more time for the people who had signed up. Sarah Gearhart. I still don't have Sarah. We do have one hand raised. It might be one of the folks that have signed up. <clears throat> Rick Solon. Whitley Sullivan. Oh, wait, Richard is on here. Okay. One moment. Go ahead, Rick. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, good morning, Chair Hall, Director Bell, and members of the council. I apologize for my tardiness, but as you're aware, uh, it's sometimes difficult to make time in my work schedule to attend these meetings. Um, I personally wanted to address a couple of uh, several points in the milepost five updates that were released on the website. That is essentially nothing but a propaganda piece for CDP with very little factual information in it. Um, all the things that they have been addressed as being uh, almost all the things that have been addressed as being improved are things that have either been forced by OHS or things that have come from tenants uh, eating the drum and, uh, you know, making the effort and doing the work. And very little has, of this has actually come from CDP, property owners, property management, any of that. Um, it's just nothing but... Like I said, it's a propaganda piece. The artist work that is being done is entirely tenant driven. Um, talk about the communications that as the FBI is posting weekly updates only because we have the, the tenant and the tenant council have repeatedly demanded that and we're still not getting all the information. There is information in this update that we have didn't have. And we have been repeatedly asking for detailed, you know, more information about what's going on in our home. Um, you talked about the wanting 24 seven security and the fact that security is only allowed to detain somebody for an hour. Yes, they're allowed to detain somebody for a whole hour and Portland police refuses to respond because of the history of the fact that CDP and previous management company Guardian refuse to prosecute, so they don't care anymore. So that relationship has to be completely rebuilt because of the information, you know, what happened to us previously. Um, the, uh, you know, the issue with the asbestos, that there, that there might have been a reason for uh, the abatement to be done the way it was. We were never told what that reason was. Um, there's, there's several doors that says that the doors have been replaced, but they haven't. There's still several doors that are broken. There's literally so much misinformation here that it's ridiculous. I don't have time to go through it all. 
but this is all stuff we have documented. Um, you know, security is not actively pursuing these trespassers. Yes, we have a wall of code with a, a list uh, with uh, trespass notices going up, and if he reported, then they will go after them, kind of. But again, because Portland police refuses to respond, security's hands are partially tied. Rick, excuse me, we're past three minutes. Thank you for your input. Uh, one more try for Whitley Sullivan. Okay. Is there anybody online who has not signed up in advance but would like to offer up to three minutes of public comment right now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is Loud and better? clear. Thank you. This is Barbara Geyer. I did sign up. She couldn't hear me the first time. Ah. Um, hi. Good morning, everyone. Barbara Geyer. I'm a principal real estate broker in Oregon. Um, I operate under Barbara Geyer Real Estate in California. I am Barbara Geyer broker and owner. And I've been licensed beginning 1977 in California. 20, the past 20 years, both California and Oregon. I'm an appointed member to the uh, Fair Housing Advocacy Committee here in Portland. But today, this morning, again, I am here as a community member only, representing just myself as a community member. Thank you. Three minutes is so short. I did finally receive um, a response to my request for what is it that, um, that o OHCS investigates? Um, in contract with HUD, and Eva Luna sent me something, and basically she said, we investigate health and safety concerns. Well, I knew that. That's the receptionist told me that. And then further, that uh, OHCS investigates complaints that fall within the purview of Project Section 8, um, or Project Base Section 8. And, uh, but no specificity as to what they are. So I don't know uh what the purview is what the is it i just have no idea so that is not at all um clear to me i would like to just quickly mention some recent complaints within the last um few months weeks um cynthia at the uh, in the complaint department where we are referred um it's an option four um, I was not allowed to put my complaint in writing. I did not receive, will not receive, I was told, to a, a response in writing to me. Um, Cynthia refused to hear that the remedy they offered would be impossible to perform. And I continued bringing that up, but she simply did not want to hear that. Um, it's pretty important to me that if you offer a remedy to a complaint, but the remedy cannot be performed. You really haven't done anything. She also, that just shocked me, she commented, I made some remark about real estate. Cynthia said, property management is not real estate. Um, and then she hung up. And of course that's gonna come as a big surprise. I have been retaliated against. Um, deposit, my deposit checks have not been uh, de deposited. And at one point I had five outstanding checks which i had sent by various methods certified mail to the um to the owners several uh, to the office um, um there i'm been sorry we're at three evictions. minutes can you wrap okay. up your thought sorry. please absolutely okay. so there have been illegal eviction notices and failure to um, uh, perform the recertification so the tenants will lose the subsidy and that's it. That's to me. That is considered retaliation when the landlord has two months to to um, um, uh, provide recertification, has documents, and fails to do so. All okay, right. Thank, thank you, you so much. Do we have anybody else? Use the raise hand function, please. Yes, we have a uh, Sarah. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. Anytime, please. Yes. Hi. Good morning, Chair Hall and Housing Stability Council members. Um, I did try and sign up at the last hour this morning, but not sure that that went through. 
Um, my name is Sarah Padilla. I'm the Grant Portfolio Director of Habitat for Humanity of Oregon. And over the past couple of years, I've worked very closely with the network of 24 Habitat for Humanity affiliates located across the state, the majority of which serve rural communities. This past year, the Habitat affiliates collectively applied for approximately $34 million in LIFT home ownership funding to build a total of 103 new affordable homes. So we are very excited about that, and we are also looking forward to the upcoming uh, release of the Notice of Funding Availability, or the NOFA, for $40 million in LIFT funding and $5 million in LIFT supplemental grants that we're expecting early in the new year. We understand that the availability of the general fund dollars to provide those LIFT supplemental support to projects is not likely to be enough to fully fund projects in areas where land appraisals are quite low, um, given that LIFT is limited to funding no more than the appraised value of the land. However, um, I'm here today because we really want to share our deep appreciation for the OHCS home ownership team for their very thoughtful and open approach to preparing for this upcoming LIFT homeownership application process and this funding opportunity. Um, we are at Habitat looking forward to continuing to partner with the OHCS homeownership team for another successful and exciting year that will um, help us increase the supply of affordable housing across the state, um, especially in those rural communities. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, going to make one more call for public comment. Please use your raised hand function. If you're on the phone only, it is star nine. All right, well, I guess that brings us to the close of public comment today, and we are ready to move along now with... Uh, the report of the chair, and I'm foregoing my time so that we have a few minutes with our new members. And at this point, I'm going to call on each of you and ask you to introduce yourself and just help us get to know you better. Margaret, new council member, Margaret Harris. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair Hall. Um, I'm Maggie Harris, and I'm a lifelong Oregonian. I um, currently live in Portland. Um, professionally, I'm a project manager for a local architecture firm here in, in town, focusing on affordable and permanent supportive housing projects specifically. Um, I'm also a PhD student uh, in Portland State University's Urban Studies program. And um, in the program, I focus on uh, research at the intersection of housing and health. Um, I'm honored to be serving on, on this council and being able to interface with both OHCS and the public on these critical housing issues. Um, and thank you for allowing me time to introduce myself. Well, thank you for joining us. Erin Meehan. Thank you, Chair Hall. My name is Erin Meehan and I am a resident of East County. I live in Gresham. I am a mom, a grandmom, a soccer coach, and a, a housing advocate. Um, I believe that housing is a human basic need. And so I'm very honored to be part of uh, the council, uh, to be part of um, the public's decisions and processes that are going on. I thank the public for coming to make their public comment because that's what I'm about. I, I think that um, if you people that are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Um, I think that's all I really have to say. Thank you for having me. Okay. And we have Christy joining us by phone. Christy Rodriguez, our third new council member. Christy, can you hear me? Good morning, Chair Hall. Yes, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great. Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm having to join via phone as I'm driving back from the Pacific Northwest back to Ontario, Oregon. Uh, but my name is Christy Rodriguez. I'm honored to serve on the Housing Stability Council. I am the executive director of the Housing Authority of Malheur and Harney County. Um, looking forward to serving on this commission as we are trying to tackle all of the housing stability issues that are occurring uh, statewide. And providing advocacy, obviously, for rural counties is one of my major passions. Um, but I have been with the Housing Authority for a little over 11 years and looking forward to serving on this council. Thank you so much for letting me be able to 
introduce myself. Well, thank you. Thank you for your willingness to serve. And same goes for all three of our new members. And we look forward, I think I can speak for the group, of saying we really look welcome you aboard and look forward to your participation in our work in the months and years ahead. So if there's nothing else at this point, uh, we'll move on to uh, the Affordable Rental Housing Division uh, part of the agenda. And again, there's a lot of multiple decision items, briefings. This is scheduled for about 90 minutes. So uh, then we'll take our break. Then we've got Homeownership Division presentation, our deep dive, and Tentatively at 1.30 will be adjourning, but let's get to the heart of things. And uh, Director Detweiler Dobby, are you ready and your team ready to take it away? I believe we are. Um, hello, Chair Hall, Council Members, um, Director Bell. Um, this is Natasha detweiler Davy, Director of Affordable Rental Housing here at OHCS. Um, and so before we get into our very uh, meaty agenda today. Um, I did want to just acknowledge um, the public comment. We do have, um, as was referenced, posted on our website, a um, reference packet of information around um, our ongoing work and tracking progress at the property. Um, here clearly from the testimony um, and uh, emails that uh, there is a continued pressure to increase on-site security. Um, I think the one of the factors that we know that we that has been identified is that the security is only empowered to detain for one hour, and um, in most cases, they are not finding that police are able to be responsive within that hour to have actual remedy to the situations that, that are going on. So I think local local police responses an impactful uh, piece of this puzzle here at the property level. And while they do have um, not 24 hour on-site presence, there is 24 seven ability to summon by making phone calls. And um, we will continue to talk with them around uh, to see where we can um, be trying to push toward getting, seeing how um, having 24 seven presence might be helpful. Um, again, these are not our operations, so this is um, trying to manage what we are able to directly do and influence. Um, and I also completely hear that uh, turnaround time on repairing and securing doors and entry points um, that are, uh, you know, become victims of uh, vandalism going on in the um, in the building um, is a pressing issue. We have over over time. Um, had uh, discussions with them and understand supply chain and historic building impacts to this. And I think a, an expectation that there is a quick turnaround to make sure that there's something put in place to secure entry points um, is, uh, does not, those, those things don't excuse that. So um, I think all of those will be continuing to follow up on within our role in our purview. Um, and then um, additional testimony around projects of, within our HUD contracted portfolio, which follow kind of different rules and process, but we'll make sure that we do have additional follow up with that testimony um, uh, as well. So really appreciate um, the continued elevation of these critical issues. Um, uh, yes, Council Member Lee. Thank you, uh, Natasha. Um, I appreciate the uh, feedback and the report that's very helpful. I would like to make a request. There is uh, one voice that we have consistently not heard in any of these conversations where we are receiving consistent public testimony, and that is the voice of the property management company. And uh, I think acknowledging that the council has virtually no authority to be able to impact this, staff has limited authority because in fact, we are not operating this, uh, uh, operating this, uh, uh, this housing complex. We're doing, we're paying the, the property management company to do it. And I would really love the property management company to come and speak specifically, not in generalities, 
but specifically in the way that Natasha, you and your team have been doing to each of the complaints and requests being made by the tenants. I'm clear about the tenants of the building. Um, I think for too long, we have not heard from the property management company. I know you and staff are likely in relationship uh, daily on these things. However, um, there's a voice that's missing here. And in my mind, it is the voice that is the most responsible for uh, addressing and responding uh, in this situation. And so I would ask that uh, you and Director Bell and staff um, figure out how that might happen uh, because the, uh, it, this is a problem, I think, that we have not heard directly as the council from the property management company. So I make that request. Thank you. Um, council Member Farrell. I don't think I could uh, repeat what Council Mary Lee just said uh, even better. So I just want to weigh in on adding another council person's support in that request. I also think it's time that we hear from them directly and clearly there's still a lot of frustration. So this might be this might be the next logical step. Chair Hall, if I may uh, just uh, yes. quickly just want to echo back. Um, the very specific request that I'm hearing from Council Member Lee and Farrell, but also I think I'm seeing signals of consensus across uh, Council as well, uh, that there's been a vacancy in the uh, discourse, at least here in uh, our monthly meetings and hearing directly from um, owner operator, operator uh, is part of this discourse. And I think what I'm hearing is a request to hear uh, in specificity in response to the tenants uh, the tenants' needs that have been vocalized. I know we've heard a lot, which we appreciate all of it, but I'm hearing the council uh, a request to hear uh, from the owners specifically as it relates to the tenants' needs that have been identified. So we will take that as noted uh, and ensure that there is follow-up uh, with specificity, uh, whether that be in writing or otherwise. So we will take that back to your hall as, as noted in advance of uh, next month's meeting. Great, thank you all. Um, and so uh, pivoting to our agenda here today, which again is uh, lots going on. Um, we have first uh, in front of you some conversations around projects and then bringing forward our modular investment um, and introducing a couple uh, new kind of deep dive conversations. So I think first up, I will hand it off uh, to Ed Brown program analyst uh, who has uh, done the small project and veterans NOFA project uh, or uh, recommendations here before you today, which are really exciting. Um, I do wanna just flag that we have one update to the projects that are being put forward. Um, as after the funding recommendations uh, went forward, we identified a um, financial uh, uh, kind of strategy question and conversation difference from our application. So one of these projects will, and Ed will signal this, um, we will not move forward into the motion today for adoption, but we'll bring forward at a future meeting once those issues are resolved. So we're making sure that we're really um, giving you the right information um, and have a balanced project that we're bringing forward. Um, so with that, Ed, I'll just hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Tasha. Uh, good morning, Chair Hall, Council Members, and Director Bell. Uh, my name is Ed Brown, and I work for the Affordable Rental Housing Division. And give me just a moment while I share my slides. There we go. And there we are. And just a quick check. Uh, everyone can hear me correctly and sees the slide. Thank you, uh, Council Member Lee. Um, I can see your thumbs up. All right, I'm here to present the outcomes of the, the Veterans and Small Projects NOFA uh, funding and our recommendations for funding. Uh, a brief overview of the NOFA for you. Uh, was released earlier this year in June. Uh, all final applications were due August 23rd. And since that time, we've been doing a review of all of the applications and uh, performing a scoring. Um, this 
NOFA is uh, uh, one of our only opportunities, which we're able to offer uh, a majority of funding for rural regions of Oregon. That was uh, out of a, a 2018 uh, community outreach to ask about how we would spend the additional funds that we have available for the GHAP account. And so we do have 60% of the, the, the small projects funding is available for, for rural areas of Oregon. Uh, is always something that we like to point out, and I'll, I'll talk about the, the breakout of, of those funds and the availability of those in a later slide. Uh, this is a competitive NOFA process, and so we're held to the, the, the threshold and scoring criteria that's communicated through that vehicle, through the NOFA process. So we have a threshold review, which is minimum items required of every project has to meet those threshold items, and then uh, we have scoring takes place, and we've had uh, four separate scoring teams uh, come together to score different elements of uh, each application uh, just to help break out the work because there's a tremendous amount of information that comes to us. Uh, so that, that accounted for 14 different scores in the scoring process to, to ensure that we're being objective and fair. Uh, and that also included members from the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs were able to join us again this year. Uh, to help us score the, the veterans portion for, for resident services and, and for that special population as we're making those funds available to those uh, project types. And then uh, in addition to that, we also were excited this year. We have a very large uh, amount of funds available and also multiple resources offered through this NOFA. And I can talk um, in brief about some of those. Uh, so here's some of the breakout or, or specific. So we have uh, $45 million of the general housing account program available for, for funding reservations through the small projects uh, side of this NOFA. Uh, small projects, we qualify as anything that's any project that has 40 units or fewer. And so we have $18 million for urban regions, $27 million for, for rural regions uh, as a set aside. Uh, then we had uh, $26 million available for, for veteran projects, essentially. Uh, there's a statutory mandate that 25% that of the general housing account is, is set aside for veterans and their families. Uh, that was part of why we're able to increase it so, so large as, uh, through the legislature. Um, there's, there's no regional variance for the veteran set aside, so it's split evenly, uh, 13 million for, for urban and rural, but we do have those set asides to ensure that we're, we're, we're spending that funding throughout the state of Oregon. Uh, and then uh, as a first in this NOFA, and we've talked about this in the past, we're, um, we're excited to offer the agricultural workforce housing tax credits through this NOFA. Uh, we only had one application uh, that had made a request for it, and unfortunately, we, we were not able to uh, recommend that project today, but we're hopeful to see that project uh, in 2024. And, uh, and this was a first go at offering these this resource through this NOFA, so we're, we're we believe we're on the right track. We're going to continue to do that in the future. We're going to um, offer those resources, but that was just one more resource that was available through this NOFA. Uh, similarly, we had up to 30 slots or units of, of permanent supportive housing. Rental assistance was made available. And then lastly, uh, we also had OHTCs available to projects up to $5 million um, per permanent loan. And with that... So in the end, we did receive 17 final applications, a cumulative request of over $94 million. Um, four of those projects did not pass or make it through our threshold review process. Um, one of the things we want to highlight is that uh, we, we have continued outreach with these projects. We're, we're actively setting up debriefs for these projects to talk about what those critical items are and um, uh, in general, I would say we, we had a great cohort of, of all of the projects that came through. We're hopeful to see those projects continue uh, through our new NOFA process next year. We're excited to have a new um, group within our department be able to work more directly with those projects. And so we're hopeful to see uh, basically all of the projects that, that came through this NOFA cycle. Um, that we're hopeful to see that they, they may all eventually uh, get to shovel ready and, and funded fully. Um, so that is something that um, that we're continuing to to work towards. Uh, but in this in this process, in this uh, competitive funding cycle, um, we did have to limit those four. And uh, in the end, we do have eleven final applications uh, for for recommendation today. 
Uh, with that, I did want to mention the the one project that the Natasha had spoke about. There's one veterans project. Uh, essentially, they had come to us uh, late last week, too late for us to make any updates to our packet, too late to make any additional review to the project prior to our recommendation. Uh, so we're we're dropping them. Uh, that project is still in the the Housing Stability Council's packet for this week. Again, it was too too late to make any updates. Um, but essentially, the project had a miscommunication between them and their architect. Uh, they had corrected the record to us. Uh, we've determined that that does not affect their scoring. That doesn't affect anything in, in threshold review. However, um, that does affect their budget. And so OHCS requires that they update their pro forma. Uh, and we need an appropriate amount of time to reevaluate that. Um, the veterans set aside of funds were under allocated normally in this process because it's competitive, we would have to move on to the next project in line. In this case, there, they would be the next project in line because there are no other projects. Uh, so because we have remaining funds available, we are able to continue to work with and evaluate them through this uh, NOFA. And uh, if, if OHCS determines that the project is able to be recommended, we may be bringing back just one project from this NOFA. Uh, in December. All right, and then here's a, a breakout or a summary of, of the projects we're, we're bringing to the Council today for, for a funding recommendation. Uh, we have six projects in the urban regions and five projects in rural regions. And the breakout there, uh, this information is also available in the packet. So for the sake of time, I won't I won't read through all of it, uh, but I will touch on a few of these points that are brought from this page. And, and during our questions and answers, if, if council would like to return back to this one, I can I can always come back. Okay. Uh, and then just a quick rundown of our allocation process uh, from the NOFA. Uh, for the veterans funding that we made available, we had 26 million, uh, often we refer to as VGHAP, offered the total eligible request from four projects uh, serving veterans was only $16.24 million. And that does include Division Street, which we're not recommending today. Um, that leaves $9.76 million available for future veteran projects. So again, we're, we're hoping to work with, uh, there were two additional projects that were requesting veterans funding uh, that we are hopeful to see potentially in, in 2024 in that first half of the year, uh, come in and utilize some of those funds. In the small projects GHAP funding side, uh, we had a total eligible request for small projects of uh, $49.8 million. Again, we had $45 million available. Uh, so that does make it competitive. Uh, we did have to uh, review um, through that scoring process which projects we were able to fully recommend for a, a full funding recommendation. Uh, in the rural project set aside, uh, there was a request for 17.04 million dollars of the 27 million set aside for rural regions. Um, the remaining rural set aside of 9.96 million is then available to be brought over to either the urban side or a general allotment of funds. So we're able to award additional urban projects then uh, from those remaining funds in that set aside. The total eligible urban project request was 28, or a little over $28 million. Uh, and OHCS, is able to fully fund or, or recommend uh, nine of the, the 10 remaining eligible urban projects uh, for a full funding recommendation. With that, uh, let me go ahead and run into, um, again, just flagging again, we do have uh, this, this new centralized funding you NOFA know, process next year, and, and we are staffing up a whole new group to be able to do uh, direct communication, be a lot more intentional about uh, speaking to pro those these applications about which items will be able to get these projects if adjusted, uh, shovel ready and able to get or, or able to be recommended for funding uh, through the council. And so we're hopeful to see uh, potentially those those improvements made and, and hopefully we'll see these projects back soon. Um, application debriefs are, active, are currently being scheduled with, with each of these uh, projects, the ones that are both awarded and uh, ones that uh, uh, we're not able to pass threshold review or not able to uh, be fully funded through the scoring process. Uh, with that, I do have a, an updated recommended motion on my next slide uh, for the council to consider, uh, which, which does not include uh, Division Street. 
And I just, um, thank you so much, Ed. And I just wanna add, chime in that later in the agenda when I'm talking about our processes and change, I'm gonna dig in a little bit on the um, kind of what Ed is referencing in terms of what our future state will look like to be able to provide those supports. And, and I think this is uh, really, ex it would be a great opportunity to, to think about how this really would, would have worked, would ill work in the new process. Thanks, Ed. Absolutely. All right, council member questions, comments, feedback. And for our new folks, we, yes, we use the raise hand function as Mary Lee is demonstrating for us. Uh, it's easiest to, to track who, who's asking for recognition and in the right order. Mary, take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ed, for the report and for the work, the tremendous amount of work that went into to getting this uh, slate of, of projects. I'm thrilled that we've gotten so many projects in rural areas outside of the, the I-5 corridor. So that, I think, is a testament to the work that the team has been doing. I just want to acknowledge that and know that we've got much more work, right? We'd like not one dollar of the rural dollars to come, you know, to be under allocated and come back the other way, although we, you know, appreciate it in, in the urban areas. So I just think this is great work. I am interested in, do you see any patterns based on the type of uh, development company or who they are, whether they're registered as MWESB, you know, part of those places. Do you see any patterns with the folks who were not qualified or didn't make sort of the initial list and um, less in the ones that were eligible and didn't get funded? Because I hear that you're going to go back and talk with them, but I'm, I'm interested in the overall pattern, right? Are we seeing certain types of organizations not fare very competitively? Are we seeing the organizations that are by, for, and about certain communities not being able to meet the uh, minimum requirements and thus are getting, you know, early out uh, in the process? And if not, and you can't answer it right now, that that's cool as well. I'm just uh, flagging that I'm interested in hearing that as we go into the future talking. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel like I can speak to that a little bit. So pattern wise, it's it's hard to say, right? Rural regions, in general, I, I feel that we have fewer um, developers who come to HCS for affordable housing development funds uh, quite as often. We we have we have more in urban areas that that are more frequent and familiar with our process. And I think that that is sort of the, the trend I see is um, when we do have uh, projects in rural regions that are there, that do pass our threshold review, or I think a lot of times um, they're, they're simply not new to development, but, but potentially new to affordable housing development and new to our NOFA process. Um, and so whether it's urban or rural, a lot of times there's a trial and error uh, process which I know um, is almost a wonderful lead in for, because I know Natasha is going to talk about this because we have an idea for this um, where well, hopefully it won't be trial and error process because that, that is painful on both sides to see that happen where uh, a lot of efforts put in there and a lot of time, unfortunately, is, is sort of between iterations between making a successful attempt. Um, and so I would say in, in my observation, in my time of, of administering this NOFA, it really comes down to familiarity and, and uh, newer partners coming to OHCS to, to build funding in rural regions. And we hope not to lose them in this process. And so I think that there's there's some exciting opportunity to, to do more outreach and um, uh, I guess just sharing of information, how to be successful before an application is submitted. Thanks, uh, Ed. To, to be uh, explicit, and we can wait till we get to this other section, I'm interested in uh, patterns that relate to racial justice and equity and uh, minority uh, developers and also out of state developers. How many of these projects are from companies who operate out of the state um, uh, versus how many operate within the state? Thanks. Any further council questions, feedback, or discussion? Hearing none, would somebody like to make the motion on screen? Don't all raise your hands at once. I'll make that motion. Okay, thanks. And do we have a second? Second. All right. Can we have a roll call now, please? Thank you, Chair Hall. 
Council Member D from Torum. Yes. Council Member Farrell. Yes. Chair Hall. Yes. Council Member Lee. Yes. Council Member Mena. Yes. Council Member Rogers. Yes, I'd just like to thank the staff for the work and this is so exciting, so yes. Thank you, we have quorum, thank you. Yay. It passes. Yep, okay, onward. Great, thank you. And I agree, this is really exciting um, to see and where, you know, these are exciting, exciting um, be able to move forward with these projects. Um, and so next up, I believe Roberto is going to be introducing an increased resource request for uh, Malala projects. And this is kind of following up on a discussion item from last month, um, or it is an outfall of our discussion item last month, where we are continuing to see um, funding gaps both in projects before they begin construction, but increasingly concerning are the projects that are actively under construction and finding um, that they have renewed uh, kind of increases through the construction proce process, putting the building at risk of not being able to move forward. Those are, I think, based on a lot of the things that we talked about last month, interest rate shifts through the construction process, um, unanticipated infrastructure requirements from uh, doing work, especially where we see that happening in rural communities. Um, and this project is exactly um, that situation and it's actually impacting two phases of a project and, and putting um, the, you know, making it so that those projects are not going to be able to serve uh, the community or actually tenants unless um, the the infrastructure resources are accounted for. And so this is happily a circumstance where this falls within our subsidy limits. Um, and so Roberto will be talking that through. Um, I know I heard last month kind of an interest in understanding more what the scale and the need is looking like. We are um, kind of constantly in a triage situation. I think I, um, I see at least five, if not six or seven projects under construction that are having challenges like this. Some of the problems um, are able to be resolved um, in creative strategies or in leveraged resources elsewhere. And that's really the triage process that we need to be working through. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that we're putting together, uh, able to put together as we are walking this through additional details and clarity around that. Um, we'll report as we um, are making strategic investments. Um, this is one that requires Housing and Stability Council approval. So with that, I think I will hand it off uh, to Roberto. Thanks, Natasha. Good morning, uh, Chair Hall, Council Members, and Director Bell. I'm Roberto Franco. I'm the Assistant Director of Development Resources in the Affordable Rental Housing Division. What, what I, we bring to you today is exactly as Natasha pointed out, a funding request and recommendation uh, for the Molala Apartments. Uh, that is phase one and phase two. And just uh, to, trying to give you enough details and information and background here, Molala Apartments uh, are a response, or have been a response in trying to get there uh, to the 2020 wildfires that impacted Clackamas County and the Molala region. Um, it is, as I, as I said, it is uh, designed as two phases, but for the purposes of financing, the developers have done them in two phases, phase one and phase two. In uh, 2021, the council approved funding for phase one, a total of uh, 60 units. And it started construction uh, last July or July 2022. And it should have been completed by now. But this is where some of the, the delays and, and the reasoning that were coming to you. Um, the city allowed the, um, what, before I say that, the site uh, is, is next or is in the corner of Highway 211. So that's part of the setup here. It's next to Highway 211 and in part of the neighborhood. The city allowed uh, the construction to start construction of phase one uh, in July of 2022. 
uh, with a limited scope and what they understood the scope uh, of uh, require improvements from the Oregon Department of Transportation. And because also of the need for to build housing and, and, and benefit the, uh, the wildfire survivors, so there was a need to start construction right away. And then here comes phase two. Uh, in August of 2022, uh, the council approved funding for the next phase, which would be 40 units. Now, as this development is soon to be completed as a whole, the uh, requirements and the scope of work and, and requirements from the Oregon Department of Transportation expanded far and beyond to what the uh, developer had anticipated and budgeted for. And so that's why we're coming when in the, the, uh, the cost of all of those improvements, and that includes uh, extending a bike lane that goes along the highway and the property is building sidewalks on both sides of the highway. So even across from the property here, making side, uh, street improvements for a turn, turning lane from the highway onto the property. It's required, the audit is requiring a street light that would go in there. And highway improvements, uh, I suppose when we don't see them, but they include all major infrastructure for water, uh, water tr uh, treatment, storm that is hidden under all of that. And that's an expensive, expensive undertaking and improvement. Delaying, so all of the construction, the beginning construction for phase one has, uh, phase two has been delayed. Phase two, which is about 85% completion, they are close to providing or getting certificate of occupancy. But the city is reluctant to provide that certificate of occupancy unless the developer provides some sort of financial guarantee that they will finish the audit required improvements. So in a way, phase one is being ho uh, held hostage for completion, can start phase, phase two because of uh, the, the added cost to it. And I think that, that so what the developer has been trying to negotiate uh, with the city with audit, audit will not reduce the scope of work. So there are two things happening here with the delays, there are added costs to the interest rate loans. There's added costs to the supplies, meaning not being able to uh, finish your contract or, or secure your purchase contract. There is impact on the labor that, that again gets more expensive. All of those are added costs. Uh, uh, so what we are recommending to the council is the addition of $4.4 million, $863,875. That will cover and help address the funding gap because of the delay, as well as the cost of the required improvements by audit. So with this, with this funding, additional funding, phase two can start construction and phase one could get to get into that certificate of occupancy and complete the 100 units. If we put this in the context of wildfire, it, it, it's a long time coming in order to provide 100 unit for, uh, units for those areas. The uh, resource that we have and recommending for is LIFT and the asking for uh, and this additional funding falls within that subsidy limit and it's still within the framework of the uh, of, of lift. Mm -hmm. And so I were making that recommendation and if the council would approve it, there is a rec uh, there is a recommended motion on page 37, but I'm more than happy to uh, address any possible questions you may have. All right, folks, uh, Council Member Rogers. Thank you for the report. I am curious about um, why the additional infrastructure requests weren't known ahead of time, uh, because typically when um, the project is first established, all of that is supposed to be lined out um, at the beginning. And so I'm just curious why it it happened at the end and where the failure was because um, we want to make sure that whatever it is, we don't 
have it repeated on another project because it's very costly. Yes, uh, Council Member uh, Rogers, um, that is what we're telling developers now as well, meaning make sure that those improvements are identified at the beginning. At the, at, with phase one, they were given a scope of those improvements. But as phase two came into play, Audit started redesigning and expanding the scope of it. So if, if there hadn't been that, it should have been addressed on phase one and get it done. And it, it's unfortunate that I think, and Natasha alluded to this as well, in some, many instances now we're finding developers being uh, placed the responsibility to do a lot of community improvements because cities don't have the funding to do. But we, we are learning from this and making sure again that uh, in future developments, if if there are improvements like this that they need to be identified, I mean, right at the beginning. So we, we totally agree with that. Council Member Mania. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, just to, to address uh, Council Member Rogers' question uh, and having living the experience right now that we have with a couple of projects in Beaverton, um, when they go through the permitting process, they 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 review the, the, the plans overall, and then as they process the construction, they begin to look at specific designs for specific items. I was just talking to our inspector yesterday in Beaverton. They told me that in one of the projects, uh, which they just received the sprinkler system uh, plan um, and is halfway built the project that when they looked at the sprinkler system, there was such a space between the ceiling where the sprinkler was going to be and the next floor that there's so much room because they have to throw a lot of plumbing and a lot of uh, electrical through that space that it became a fire hazard because uh, there's so much room. And so they require by state to put some type of sprinkler on that space or do some drywall in it. So that adds, the adds up to the cost. And they wouldn't have known that until they actually get that specific plan to say, this is what we're looking to do. And they and they review it and they, they make those requirements. Um, it, it, it is a challenge and specifically to, to one of our projects that we have and we've been working on for two years is when we have multiple jurisdictions associated with the project when you have a road that's owned by a different entity than the site and some other entities that um, we don't um, talk to each other and we're not, there's no flexibility in some of those requirements. And so uh, it really adds up to, to the cost. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that we need to do as an industry to find a way to really um, negotiate or and talk about how do we, uh, while maintaining the integrity of each of the jurisdiction's requirements, uh, become a little more flexible to allow uh, and minimize the costs associated with it. Um, and and so I, you know, I understand the challenges that are happening right now in projects that are in, in construction and the ones that are right now in the pre-development phase. We're seeing that in Beaverton uh, uh, live. So, thanks. Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Chair Hall. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Mena, for uh, offering that background and for Councilmember Rogers to have um, opposed it. I wonder, and maybe this is getting us again in the future place, it, it, you know, we talked about we have developers who are new who might not have had this experience of getting something through, but not having asked, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and this is just, again, me thinking out loud. Is it possible for us to consider including in the application, did you ask the city ahead of time, knowing that we don't know what we know and they know what they don't know or any of those things specifically about this, these uh, kinds of um, community uh, improvement assessment pieces? I get the, the fire safety is a, is a different issue, but these places where additional uh, responsibilities to build infrastructure in communities are maybe aren't clarified until way down the road. Can we ask people to ask about that if they're not, you know, again, with this thing about we have new developers, maybe they're not 
uh, you know, practice with this. And the second thing is, can we communicate with some of these cities <laughs> across the state and say, hey, we're all about affordable housing. We think you might be too, although I think that, you know, differs from city to city. And here's some of the challenges that you might not understand when there are last minute changes adjust to, you know, leveraging of sewer, water line fees, schools fees, roads fees at the end of a project that will get in the way of affordable housing coming to your community. Now, in some cases, that may be a good thing. In other cases, I think cities would want to work with us if they could. These might, you might have done all these things, and I'm speaking from ignorance, and it makes me think about this because it's going to keep happening despite our saying, let's not have it happen. Um, and so if we don't do something different and these two things may not be the right thing to do different, we're gonna keep getting this and this and this and in an event it's gonna uh, compress the number of new units we can actually get uh, online in various communities. Thanks. Uh, that is, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Council, Council Member Lee. Um, we, we, it's a good reminder uh, for us uh, to keep that close partnership also with the, uh, the League of Oregon Cities, and that's one of our partners, and really bring it up at that level, uh, meaning what, what, is, what housing does to the cities and where, and where the cities can participate in some of this. Again, I think each city, each jurisdiction faces different financial challenges in order to do that. And so I think, again, it's a reminder to keep that partnership and collaboration with the league, as well as as we are redefining and redesigning our funding offerings that we will have an opportunity to really address many of these before we can get to a funding award and commitment so that we don't face this again. So yes, there's a lot of uh, different touch points that we need to keep in mind. And I think uh, 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 Council Mena did allude to this, we we are one state agency all that is a different one so different times of responses and all of that so it still falls on us to an extent meaning be as we're the stewards of public funding to make sure that we can still do that and work across some of our, our partnerships uh, to that thank you council member Mian. hi thank you um for your uh, great report and appreciate Councilmember Lee, Councilmember uh, Rogers for um, bringing this uh, bringing this up. One of the things I, I recall uh, is that we have urban planners, and um, I know that when I was in college and we were uh, taking that class, my urban planner she said, "You know, it would be really nice if the developers would, uh, you know, ask us." You know, um, I know that the, Portland has a comprehensive plan. I'm, I'm not sure about each city. But they have plans that say, you know, you need to have so many parking spots per and you need to have so many trees per and all those kinds of things. Um, and so is there some kind of relationship with uh, the planners of the these areas um, that say, you know, you need to have so much. Uh, we got to have a crosswalk when we have this many people. We, we need to have, you know, bike lanes when we um, for affordable housing or bus stops and those kinds of things. And I know that the planners put that into their plan, but um that I noted, noticed that that uh, my my college professor was always kind of harping about that there wasn't that kind of relationship building between developers and the city and the funders and and that kind of thing. So just wondering if there's anything like that in place. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Council Member Mihan. Yes, um, and also uh, we're 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 betting, we're counting, and we're making sure that as, as we redesign our funding offering and also restructuring in the affordable rental housing division of bodies of work, that we will have staff, I think we're calling them technical advisors, to help us be this liaison with local communities, local developers, certainly with planners, uh, community development directors in the jurisdictions, so that we can plan and organize and coordinate the development of housing in their community. So we are we are thinking about it. It's in part of our plans. Uh, so I think it's just trying to get there. So we're 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 in a hiring spree <laughs> in in restructuring our bodies of work. But technical advisors is one one group that uh, will help us in many of those areas. But thank you. Any further council input, discussion, feedback, questions? Well, are we ready for the motion on page 37? 
Would somebody like to make that motion, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second we need, we need please? Second. Okay, now the roll call, please. Thank you, Chair Hall. Council Member DeFontorum. Yes. Council Member Farrell. Yes. Chair Hall. Yes. Council Member Lee. Yes. Council Member Mena. Yes. Council Member Rogers. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Yay. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much for uh, the approval, but also that discussion. I think um, I'll follow up on a lot of those threads uh, a little bit later in our agenda. Um, now up uh, for discussion or um, end motion is the framework for our modular investment. And this we um, brought back to you a couple of months ago, got some really great feedback and have responded to that. Um, and uh, Britt and Rick will be discussing through that today. Um, just as a reminder, this is another, this is a place where this is a different type of investment for us. It's uh, kind of top among the governor's priorities for implementation. Um, so we are, um, making sure to be as responsive and, and as we engage in, in this thoughtful design um, and engage with a little bit of a different stakeholder group uh, than our traditional audience and uh, feel really excited to be able to move forward with this. Um, so with that, Britt, I'll hand it off uh, to you and let me know if you have any, you got the tech covered. Great. I think so. Please let me know if you can't see the, the PowerPoint. But I think Rick's going to start us off, and then I'll I'll jump in. Great, thanks. Oh, thanks, thanks, Brett. I forgot. Um, uh, good morning, Chair Hall, Director Bell, and Council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Rick Rizek, and I'm the Assistant Director of Planning and Policy in the Affordable Rental Housing Division. Uh, as Natasha mentioned, we're back today to present updates uh, we've made to our draft framework for the Modular Housing and Development Fund um, after receiving your feedback uh, at the September meeting. Um, after we present those updates, we hope to receive council appro approval on the framework and move forward with the release, uh, the release of the request uh, for application for these funds. Um, and with that, I'll turn this over to Britt to present, to kind of represent what we uh, put, have put together and kind of highlight some of the changes that we've made. Britt? Thank you, Rick. Hello again, Chair Hall, Director Bell, Council members, and welcome new members. For the record, my name is Britt McLean, and I'm an Operations and Policy Analyst in the ARH Division here at OHCS. We really appreciate the opportunity to give you a brief refresher, share some substantive changes that we've made since we last presented to you in September, and answer any questions that you have before voting on the program framework. Just a few reminders. The Modular Housing Development Fund was established in House Bill 2001 and 28. 89 from the 2023 legislative session. It created a new one-time $20 million business development fund. The fund is intended to expand the modular housing industry's production capacity through business development grants to be rapidly deployed. Again, business development is a new body of work for the agency, and the modular industry is a newer housing partner. Legislative sponsors identified three categories of housing demand outlined in the bill that grantees of these resources must prioritize, meaning that the legislature has functionally prescribed who will be served initially by these manufacturers' expanded capacity. Those are local governments across Oregon uh, after a natural disaster like a wildfire, low-income housing, and moderate-income housing. Just a few program framework highlights we want to mention again. We plan to award grants of up to $5 million, likely to fund for manufacturers for eligible uses that include, but are not limited to, increasing and, oh, let me, sorry about that. Let me go. I don't see it. the slides advancing. Thank sorry you. about that. <laughs> okay. Are we there? Yeah. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, these uses are ex uh, increasing and expanding manufacturing uh, footprint, purchasing a specific piece of equipment, standardizing unit or component design, developing internal infrastructure, enhancing transportation methods, and advancements in materials and technology. 
Our scoring panel will include representatives from culturally specific organizations, agencies that perform business development work, and folks with experience in the modular industry, as well as internal OHCS staff. We've already started that outreach and commitment process. Okay, um, just, uh, you know, we, we spent some time learning the distinctions between the modular and manufacturing housing industries. It's pretty common to think of these two interchangeably. The legislative sponsors made it clear, however, that these funds are intended for modular capacity expansion specifically. These two differ in terms of construction processes, building codes, the unit mobility, financing, and design. And we won't talk through each one, but we do want to mention a couple of key differences here that we think are helpful detail for the framework. Those are the regulatory authorities under which they fall and some basic general differences in their construction and design. For regulatory bodies, modular housing is subject to state and local building codes and regulations like traditional site built or stick built homes. Modular must adhere to the same standards for state safety, quality, and energy efficiency. Manufactured housing, on the other hand, follows a different set of federal construction and safety standards governed by HUD. For the construction process, modular housing is built in sections or modules at a factory and then transported to the, to the construction site for assembly. These modules can be customized to meet specific design requirements, and then they're anchored to a foundation at the housing site. Manufactured housing is built entirely in a factory and then transported to the site as a complete unit or units that are then joined on site. Okay. After receiving really important council feedback it's at the September meeting, we've been exploring additional approaches to meet OHCS's commitment to creating measurable, actionable, and meaningful equity impact through this new initiative. OHCS's MWESB program guidance indicates that the regional participation goals are triggered when multifamily housing development projects utilize OHCS housing resources. We are so grateful for MWESB program lead Claudia Kentu's experience in thinking through how these goals could also apply to manufacturers, especially in the absence of specific development projects. Together, we created some additional parameters to the framework that include planning and reporting procedures for grantees of this fund. This means that grantees who plan to contract with outside firms to perform work in line with their grant will trigger regional MWESB goals. For example, a firm that plans to expand their warehouse space and who will hire contractors to complete that work will need to complete an MWESB performance and compliance report. Sorry about that. Additionally, in response to council discussion and feedback in September, we have updated the framework, which previously utilized the agency standard DEI agreement. Applicants will now be required to craft an equity-centered management plan that outlines how they will operationalize their commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion within their organization. Applicants will describe which they are currently prioritizing, outline their successes, and then have to couple it with specific steps they plan to take to continue this work. Applicants are required to draft an impl implementation plan with benchmarks in their business impact, their workforce, and internal assessment, external communication methods, and accountable leadership. Grant applications submitted without a robust ECMP will not be considered for funding. Applicants must meet a minimum point threshold in their ECMP score to move forward for funding consideration. Progress on grantees ECMP will be a required piece of reporting back to OHCS. We're very happy to have this new opportunity to prioritize OHCS equity commitments with newer partners. And with that, we welcome any questions that you have. Council? Any questions, discussion, feedback, Council Member Lee? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Britt and Rick. I am thrilled to see the um, new work that uh, you all and staff have been doing, and I just appreciate the responsiveness. It's very exciting to see what we might do when we actually center uh, racial justice and equity and uh, look at how we can do our work together. So I'm thrilled with that, and I thank you very much. I have uh, two other um, sort of random ideas, and there's no response needed. They can just be, oh, 
consider it. The first is, I wonder about any considerations for companies doing work in, in state or companies who are from out of state. And I ask this, especially when we're talking about economic development, there has to be a component of economic justice with that. And I think we are looking at that with some of the work that you all have uh, described around uh, racial justice and equity. I also think there is a thing about who's in the, who's in the state who's doing work and who's getting the development opportunities to be better at doing the work. And for me, there is a clear priority that in-state companies are, are should be getting first in line to any of these kinds of benefits. So I, I just raised that. And then, um, no, I'll forego, uh, sorry, I'll forego my second one. So thank you for the racial justice pieces and uh, think about if there are any ways that we could uh, lift up uh, in-state, thank you. Hey. Thank you, Council Member Lee. We um, are limiting funds to in-state uh, uh, organizations, so that I should have mentioned that that's an important piece of the of the program framework. But that yes, exactly. We we totally one hundred percent agree, and as do the legislative sponsors. We're limiting the dollars to in-state development, so there could be a company out of state, but they have to be building in-state. All right, Council Member Mania. There you go. Uh, thank wow. you, Cheryl. I would just like to echo uh, Councilmember Lee's comment. Uh, I greatly appreciate the staffs um, uh, hearing what we had to say and really coming back with some quality proposal that it, it strives to get at what we're trying to do. So thank you so much for your being responsive and really looking forward to see what we can get from, from this type of funding. All right. Uh, anything else from the council in the way of feedback, discussions? Are we ready then for the motion, which you will find on page 40 of your packet? A move, approve. Thank you. Now we just need a second. 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 Okay. Can we have the roll call, please? Thank you, Chair Hall. Council Member DeFantorum? Yes. Council Member Farrell? Yes. Chair Hall? Yes. Council Member Lee? Yes. Council Member Mena? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Chair Hall, I, before we move on, I just had a, a question of curiosity. So this was a big uh, agenda item from the legislature and the governor. We're now ready to put the money out into the community with some really exciting pieces. What's our communication plan back to the governor and the legislature specifically on this project, right? Because this was a big agenda item. It might not be the biggest uh, project that we're, we're taking care of. And I think it's important to show people, oh, you gave me this money here. Here's what we're doing with it because it's also really exciting and sort of building that loop. And so I'm just curious about the communication uh, 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 piece with uh, this. Yeah, thank you for that, Council Member Lee. Natasha, if you don't mind, I'll jump in and uh, take this and feel free to supplement. Uh, so I really appreciate this uh, question, Council Member Lee, because I think we've previewed previously for the council We'll talk a little bit more later on in the agenda around how we're preparing for 2325 implementation at the direction of uh, certainly the, the council and needs and priorities there, but also with the direction and alignment of the governor as well. So uh, two things I'll name on this. Uh, the team has been in close contact with uh, all of the folks that, that they've mentioned that have helped support and make sure that this is uh, done adequately and also help to build our competency around it, but also with legislators and communities that have really pushed for this investment, both have given us feedback and have you know, also named expectations around timeliness of, of this as well. Uh, the other facet of the conversations that we have had have been with the governor, both in the development of this, uh, but also laying out what the timelines associated uh, to, this pro, uh, uh, to this particular investment will look like. So coming out of the conversation as the team gears up for implementation, we will both be in co um, uh, continued conversation with the governor and also with those key legislators on when the RFP is going out, what comes of it, what we glean from it, uh, whether our assumptions are accurate, what we're learning from uh, that process. 
Um, and then also I think, uh, I imagine there will be continued conversations around um, not only just the implementation piece, but what are we learning along the way? Because I think understandably there is a great deal of a need for capacity building in this area. Um, and like anything, when you do something new, there are gonna be new and unexpected things that we learn along the way. So uh, there will continue to be that uh, ongoing conversation around implementation and then um, also around just timeliness of the process, what we're learning along the way with that as well. So what the council can expect from us, council member Lee, and then all of the council members is for us to bring the council along in that same process. So there will be parallel conversations both around uh, when the RFP goes out, uh, when we engage in the process of determining uh, who gets funded, what we learn from it so the council can uh, expect to be uh, engaging in that learning with us along that process um, so that we can be in uh, both right relation and I think constant conversation uh, along the way. Okay. Great, um, thank you so much. And I just, on the from the programmatic seat, I think there is required reporting going on annually from these investments so that we're really ensuring that we're um, tracking outcomes and reporting back and sharing what the impact of this investment looks like. Um, and so I think that moves us in away from the voting items within ARH items into the input and feedback. First up here we have, um, I think Rick will be taking the lead on um, an introduction of our PSH risk mitigation pool resources and that draft framework for input. And then underneath the umbrella of process change, I have a lot of uh, pretty meaty topics, which I'm hoping to walk through as well. Um, so hopefully we have time to get through all of that. Um, and first up here is the PSH um, uh, risk mitigation pool. And so I will um, share my screen here for Rick. I think just for a little bit of uh, context setting um, for you all, including our new council members at the table. Um, PSH is permanent supportive housing, and our effort is focused on, our initiative resources are focused on chronically homeless households. And but the, the like whole structure of that PSH initiative is focused on, um, I think, I think so in my mind, it's a three-legged stool. I think there's a strategy where it's for, but it's having a, a housing unit related rent assistance to support those tenants to make sure that they are limited to paying only, I think, 27% of their household income and then supportive tenancy services. So case management level services, that's different than just regular resident services, things offered and are specifically aligned with tenancy supports. In our launching of our PSH initiative, we work in collaboration with the Corporation for Supported Housing, who walks teams of project owners, project managers, and service providers through um, a five-month cohort of learning and uh, relationship building to be able to set those projects up for success. The PSH risk mitigation pool is now, uh, as we have been working this PSH initiative for several years, identifying a need to have another type of support to make sure that these are ongoing uh, um, value, valued assets in community and feasible for owners to um, want to have in their portfolio. Um, so with that, Rick, um, I will hand it off to you and Amy who are driving this effort. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Natasha. I feel like uh, I, there's not much for me to present. You did such a wonderful oh, I'm job. Sorry. No, 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 no. I, 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 I was thanking you for that. That was great. Uh, it was a great intro. Uh, good morning again, uh, uh, Chair Hall, uh, Director Bell, and Council members. Again, for the record, my name is Rick Rizek, and I'm the Assistant Director of Planning and Policy and Affordable Rental Housing Division. And I have Amy here to help me with questions, who's the state development resource office uh, manager here at in the affordable rental housing division um we're I'm, I'm here we're here today to provide an introductory look at our psh risk mitigation pool program which we hope to make available to our partners sometime in the spring of, of 2024 
Um, the RMP concept was developed by staff um, as we pulled together needs for the 2023 legislative session. At the time, we were hearing from partners that property damage at PSH facilities was more prevalent than anticipated, um, and partners were concerned about operating costs at that time. As PSH is a relatively new program for us, um, um, we are very much regularly, uh, regularly evaluating the program for ways to improve and make it better. Uh, this, re this, this repeated concern that we heard was something that very much caught our attention um, as, we, as we continually evaluate um, how our PSH properties are doing. Um, during the uh, policy and option package process, the concerns around damages expanded really into an insurance conversation um, and the relationship between excessive damage and insurance increases and really um, the, the fear that um, many of our PSH operators may end up losing their insurance coverage altogether. Um, to, to kind of expand um, our outreach, a survey was issued and additional engagement opportunities with various partners occurred uh, based on this feedback. OHCS has refined our, refined our framework to largely align with some locally operated uh, risk mitigation pools that are already in operations and modified ours to align with our, what our partners have expressed their needs uh, were around PSH. In the 2023 session, we were fortunate enough to receive $4 million to establish our new PSH risk mitigation program. Next slide. Um, the concept is to use um, the pool resources that we receive to reimburse property owners for damages caused by eligible PSH tenants. Only eligible damage, primarily beyond uh, normal property wear and tear, would be covered. Um, the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve is that we're hoping to provide operating support to assure property long-term viability. Uh, we're hoping to reduce insurance claims that properties have to make, which um, hopefully will limit insurance increases that they're seeing and minimize insurance cancellations uh, due to excessive claims, which um, our, our operators are very fearful of. And, and and not just on PSH properties. Oftentimes, they have insurance that covers their entire por portfolio, and so if they would lose their insurance, they would lose their insurance on their entire portfolio. And so that is it leaves many of them gun shy to um, to add PSH properties to their portfolio, and that's something that we don't want them to have to be concerned about. Um, so it would also curb any disincentive, like I said, for developers uh, concerned about new PSH development. Uh, ties to insurance increases or cancellations. The framework that we're proposing um, utilizes coordinated, well, at, it, it, it actually um, would, would cover, what the, let me start over, I apologize for that. Originally our plan was to cover property that uh, has graduated from our institute process. Our engagement process led to expansion of that original concept uh, to, to the listed eligibility requirements on this. Uh, so the listed uh, uh, um, eligibility requirements would be that they utilize coordinated entry or other OHC approved processes uh, to fill their units, utilize project-based rental assistance, incorporate wraparound supportive services, and are currently in the PS OHCS portfolio. So you have to have those four items, all of them to be eligible for these funds. The uses would include uh, physical damage, including costs to repair units and community spaces beyond normal wear and tear, extraordinary, extraordinary operational losses, which I'll get into uh, in a second, um, and uh, relocation costs. Um, extraordinarily, Examples of extraordinary operational losses may include, but not be limited to, limited to things like rent owed, but not collected after 90 days, or rent during vacancy turnovers when it exceeds 60 days. For So for example, they have a situation where the, the, depart, the, the apartment had sustained a lot of damage and they couldn't turn it over within 60 days. We'd wanna make sure that they continue to receive operating uh, uh, funds and as rent uh, until they can get that unit released. So that's the theory behind that, that particular one. 
the way we've structured this is uh, we've had many conversations with partners about how to calculate kind of the maximum amount that we would we would uh, allow to go to a particular project to make sure that the, the funding is spread out amongst all of our partners and they all, um, all have a, an ability to, to utilize the fund. And after much discussion and understanding of the limitations of this uh, of this particular approach that we're moving forward, we believe bedroom size is the best metric to determine eligibility amounts. Uh, though damage claims may include community areas, maximums are calculated by the number of PSH units times the maximum eligible amount. Um, unlike some local um, um, risk mitigation pools that we've seen, uh, we are proposing that we have a 10-year maximum on a project, uh, and then and then they have they renew their eligibility uh, to receive these resources um, after that 10-year period. Um, obviously, this depends upon continued funding. That four year, four million dollars we received will not probably <laughs> last that long. Um, our hope is that uh, this particular uh, funding resource is something that is renewed by the legislature on an ongoing basis. In terms of uh, our tenant tenant focused equity and racial justice alignment. Um, some of the kind of obvious things are PSH units are, are designated for individuals and families experiencing chronic homelessness as defined by the local continuum of care organization and referred through established, established coordinated entry processes. BIPOC individuals and families are overrepresented among these those experienced homeless. Um, so the PSH is really important um, to, 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 to support those families. All recipients are required to be to be providing culturally responsive supportive services and rental assistance, thereby serving our most vulnerable um, uh, residents and citizens. Projects are required to pro provide tenant demographic reports and participate in our HMIS system. And all PSH Institute developments are eligible for this program and would have received instruction on how to develop their projects utilizing a culturally specific lens. Also want to point out that we are taking this particular program through our internal REIT project or process, which is our racial equity analysis and tool, uh, which we think is really important. Um, and um, we, you know, we've really gone to great lengths uh, to ensure that our PSA program is tenant focused, utilizing an institute process instructed by, as Natasha mentioned, the, the Corporation for Supportive Housing, who, who utilizes a tenant focused approach in all of their instructions. And so um, that's that's um, that's our um, equity and racial justice alignment with this particular program. And I think we, we want to leave you or or what, what we have for you today, other than just kind of general feedback is um, kind of cutting through a lot of the, the verbiage here is how do we go about distributing these dollars in a manner that strikes the right balance for all our partners, uh, considering access, project distribution, etc. Right now, 67% of our uh, PSH um, units are, are located in metro areas. Um, however, most of those um, have access to an RMP already because there are some local RMPs already out there. So who doesn't have access to these types of funds already are 33% are in rural areas. And so we're struggling with striking the right balance of making sure that uh, our rural folks have the ability to, to, to access these funds, but also we want to make sure that our urban areas who may have exhausted already um, some of those, those local pools are also not left out in the cold and have the ability to continue to make sure um, that their projects um, have, are viable and can continue in the future. And so um, we've thought about making sure that there's some sort of regional set asides. We're just really not sure how to approach that and thought maybe council might have some ideas for it. So with that, um, I, I open up for questions. Thank you. Questions, comments, Councilmember Rogers. This is exciting to extend um, the permanent supportive housing. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned that struck me or caught my attention was the operating um, loss that uh, would be paid. So 
I don't want to get down into the weeds, but just would like to put out there that I think there needs to be further development as far as how that might be determined. Because um, if a building is already has a, a low occupancy and they see, you know, these funds are available, are we how are we going to set the time frame? I mean, um, does it have to to be okay? The funds are available uh, starting today, so it's only going to be applicable to um, any vacancy past that time. So I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. The next thing that you mentioned is that it's going to be a 10 year um, time period renewal for the particular property or something. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, so so there's a maximum associated with each project, and that maximum is, is calculated use, using that bedroom calculation. And so um, what, what we're proposing is that um, a, a project can utilize that maximum amount uh, for up to 10 years. And then at that point, so they, they could have multiple claims that don't go up to that maximum amount until they hit that maximum amount. Once they hit the maximum amount, they can't request any more funding for us until that 10 year period has ended. And then, and then they would be able to renew their ability to make claims once again, um, which is different than most of the RMPs we see, which have been lifetime restrictions. Um, 10 years may be too long. I'd love to hear some feedback yeah, so on that. Um, Not but, to, yeah. to interrupt, but that's sure. where I was going. So yeah. if we're only going to know if we have the funding every two years, why wouldn't we say two years as opposed to 10, since we don't know if or not um, the funding will be available past the 10 year period. So yes, 10 years sounds too long um, yeah. to me. Thank you. So thank you. Further comments, questions, feedback, discussion from the council. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, thinking about, Rick, the question that you posed, like, how can we, I can't remember which slide it was, but, you know, how can we take some of the, right, distributing these dollars. So I think we've got a lot of great examples in both the lift uh, uh, approaches and in the veterans projects that we just funded here. I do not have a problem with set asides. I think it is a reflection of intentionally putting the resources where we believe they are needed or have the greatest opportunity of impact in support of our policy agendas, right? So, and the fail safe to that is exactly what we saw in the veterans uh, projects was here's the set aside. If it doesn't get utilized, it goes over to the other side, right. you know, whatever the two sides are, it goes over into the other pot of money in order to make sure that we fully utilize um, the resources. And I would suggest that we think about set asides uh, for geographic considerations, rural urban, and for uh, culturally specific uh, communities and uh, organizations of color. Because I think the other thing that we have to consider is not simply centering the tenant experience, because in a lot of these projects, the tenants have already been identified and they are predominantly not black, uh, indigenous and people of color, households, individuals, families. And so we've got to also understand what is the environment in which this building is operating along with who are the tenants and what are the tenants needs. So uh, it, trying to think both individual experience and structurally is part of our challenge. And um, on the structural side, I think considering some set-asides or using some of the practices that we've already tested and I think are working in some ways uh, are the ways in which uh, I would suggest we go. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Defentorum. Yes, thank you, Chair Hall. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I just want to reiterate um, and tag on a little bit to what Council Member Rogers said. Pardon me. On the operational um, piece, item C in particular on page 50, I would I think we need to put some type of cap on there so that we're not incentivizing not filling the units and having them vacant. Um, not that I think people would intentionally do that. But somebody might, you never know. So I think that there needs to be some type of a limit there. Um, 
I don't know if I heard it or if I read it in the um, presentation documents that the rent will be 27% of a household's income. Is that what I understood? Yeah, I, I like that. I think you could even go lower if you could figure out the piece between the um, operational need and um, what a tenant can afford to pay. 27% of an adjusted income is, um, I think 30% is the HUD standard. 27% for a low income family is still that's a pretty big lift. That's a lot of money. Um, people with fixed incomes, um, that doesn't leave them a whole lot. So um, thank you for the framework though. I'm excited about the direction this is going. Council member Mena. Mena. Uh, thank you, Chair Hall. Um, I would, uh, again, yeah, it, it's a great uh, option. I think this projects definitely need the resources. Um, I, I don't know how to respond to the question about how can we help projects or um, in outside of, in the rural areas uh, access these resources. I, it, it, I, you know, I think that's a perfect conversation for uh, the areas themselves and find out what is needed. Um, in terms of the commitment and time frame, I, I do think that 10 years is about right. And the reason I, I say that is because if we're successful, um, the unit, the turnover on the units probably would be every two, three, four years. So you would want some history in it in order to be to, to see what what you know what the success or failures of it are. Uh, so it, to me, it sounds like 10 years is about right, not more than that. And you know, maybe eight to 10 years, but I think that we do need some type of uh, space for to be able to assess the success. Okay. More from the council. Uh, council member Meehan. I, I just wanted to throw in there that I, I do feel like some kind of oversight for um, you know how these uh, PSH buildings and things are being maintained, and in, in, in general speaking, uh, generally speaking, because I, I know that uh, damages can come, but usually that takes time. And if um, you know there's quite a significant damage over periods of time, and they're not really getting checked in or, or getting looked at, I, I feel like you know maybe uh, that that should be considered just some kind of oversight and feedback just from from uh, time for these places, for places that we, you know, support financially for sure. Anybody else want, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, yeah, we, we do have our compliance department does do in regular inspections on all of our properties. Um, and so we do do that, that, that is part of our, our compliance groups um, requirements and our, our PSH units that will, would, would fall under that general compliance, those general re compliance requirements. Um, and Amy, I don't know that there's any additional, gonna, yeah, okay. I was gonna say additionally, we do programmatic audits of all of our PSH funded units, the ones that were funded are funded through our, um, our OHCS permanent supportive housing program annually at this point. So we're on site um, looking through tenant files, looking at the physical condition of the building, not in the same way that our compliance people do, but it's another set of eyes on those properties annually. Okay. Further discussion. Well, I sense that uh, this discussion is wrapping up and what are our next steps going to be? Um, that's, uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much for the input. I think the next step, um, looking at Rick, who I'm probably again, <laughs> uh, was going to say this himself, but I think the next step is going back, incorporating this feedback, doing, um, taking the next steps to finalize a framework. Um, and we'll bring that back, I think, I likely in January, um, unless all stars align and we feel incredibly ready within a month. But I think this is um, plenty to continue to follow up and vet through um, discussion. Any other parts of that, Rick, that you'd like to flag? 
just that we want to, there's a little bit more engagement we want to do too. We've done a lot of engagement at this point, but there's 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 at least one more meeting that we want to have um, to make sure that we have um, really reached out to everybody um, that's a stakeholder in this process. And then and then yeah, the plan is to come back in in January, uh, taking this feedback, the feedback uh, from that engagement. And we still have a little bit more alignment to do uh, with some of the other RMPs. Um, how does that work? If um, from from a property management experience, who do they apply to first? So we we need to figure out exactly how those funds will interact with one another, um, and we hope to all have all that done by January. So and really appreciate the feedback. Thank you so much. Great. Bye. Thank you, Chair Hall. So I think now I will um, step into um, the last, uh, but not not simple <laughs> um, engagement um, with you all today around affordable rental housing resource and funding process. Um, and so this is, I think, you know, uh, building in conversations. I think our agenda items earlier this morning um, just really, I think, echoes the opportunity that we have with revised roles, um, kind of updates in our structure to support our future work um, is just so abundantly needed. And so I'll try to flag that as we go. Um, I have tried to put, I did put a presentation together this time thinking that will let me kind of show stuff on the screen, um, talk about it, and we can piece by piece uh, see if there's any um, kind of thoughts that you all have around them as we go versus stacking them all to the end. Um, so first, I'm just going to kick off by what this looks like internally to OHCS, what this change uh, work means, how we are driving to um, to support increased production and really step up the re really needed roles that are currently not uh, had not been invested in. Um, and then really dig in on our resource and funding process engagement. In the memo, I included some of the themes that we are hearing that we've been in, um, and reflecting back around what it is that we need to do to make sure that we are responsive to the feedback. Uh, and then I just want to do some signaling of where we are thinking about our own production strategies and what we think would be impactful in our work moving forward to continue to grow um, and grow investment in, in, in communities across the state. Um, so first, uh, and I'm going to kind of talk through this, I have a slide with some text and I'll bounce back to this document. This is um, our affordable rental housing division um, under uh, it, within OHCS. So we are supported by central services, human resources, research, public affairs, the equity, diversity, inclusion office, and we finance investments in partnership with a debt management group. And this is our ARH division structure. Um, part of what we are, what I'm working to do and implement are some adding some broad structural change to add more supports. And the groups highlighted in the black font are new bodies of work that we're looking to stand up. And I'll get back to this graphic in a second. Um, but really explicit to this change is expanding the leadership team, creating a deliberate body over the production team constituting a new operations team. I'll expand on that in a second. Um, and then underneath all of those bodies, creating a core application team to focus on processes as it has been through our NOFA process. Our, those application processes have been run through the program analysts, um, which is uh, a lot of duties <laughs> under, one, um, uh, under one hat and um, where we are trying to centralize resource offerings gives the opportunity to centralize that application process and stewardship of a uh, process responsiveness under one umbrella. We are um, constituting our own data systems team to focus on data tracking, system standards, processes, and reporting capabilities. We work in direct relationship with our research department and also need to have internal supports within ARH to support our system use um, to really make sure that when we are 
wanting to summon information to inform decision making. We have been doing all that we need to do in our upfront system and data tracking and report creation to be able to do that. And as we find holes and deficits, we need to have a team that can actively step into that process to remedy without it being, you know, a 18 month process for someone to add to their their current work. Um, we're I'm creating a strategic initiatives team that will have dedicated leadership over some of our key initiatives to focus to driving clarity, building national local relationships, thinking about those around the MWSB and equity impacts, preservation, permanent supportive housing and housing finance broadly as places where we are all across all of our different groups doing work in this space, but really need to have leadership identified that is empowered to be the kind of direct engagement into those into those areas of expertise. Um, to make sure that we're not just being responsive, but we are being thoughtful and strategic looking forward. Um, and then we are standing up a new pipeline slash technical advisor team to be able to provide that upfront technical guidance and feedback on early project concepts and financing strategies, and also really critically to be relationship managers. As we were talking about earlier, and the themes that have been coming through the project recommendations today, both, um, you know, a handful of projects that did not meet threshold for funding, those would have likely all been issues that could have been flagged very early in a consult with a technical advisor. And so that by the time they are putting in their application with an actual pro forma, those issues could have been remedied. And so where we are concentrating all of that in a competitive space, we don't have that opportunity for equity of access and similar rules and standards. This idea of having an upfront technical advisor to be able to ask those questions very early as you're saying, okay, this is my back of the napkin. What do I need to be thinking about? It is also an opportunity to think about those jurisdictional relationships that we were talking about in reference to permitting, to connections to ODOT, to be able to say, this is a deliberate body that is that, you know, individuals that are charged with going and having those curious conversations, bringing groups together to have those conversations. And quite honestly, our current production team, our current program team is balancing the needs of, you know, countless projects and, and requirements on their desk. And so the we just do not have, and I know capacity is the big C word, but it is, you know, I think it is the functional role to have a deliberate piece of your accountability to having that lens on relationship management will be critical, I think, to moving it forward. Um, we are, um, in terms of making all of this change, I have contracted with some change management consultants to make sure that we are navigating this change as well as possible to support staff evolution of these roles. And we wanna, as we are pinning down the final details of all of the structural change that we are kind of currently driving into, um, it is critically important to me that our internal subject matter experts are informing where work really needs to belong. And so while our, you know, process of emergency order and this ability to do this retooling and receive positions happened in advance of that really deliberate, explicit, detailed staff engagement. It is work that we are now starting to enter into. Um, and I'm really thankful to be able to have the support um, with uh, some uh, consultants on board. And so I'll just kind of flash back to this org chart kind of high level look. Um, so these, you know, this is the my role up here in the top. We have a series of um, assistant directors, development resources. Roberto Franco um, had, had pre production had previously been part of this development resources side. Really felt that it was important to separate out the production team, both by virtue of how large that work has gotten with the increased pipeline, but also the need to stand up underneath development resources, a new application team to support that work of, of an application process. And then under a production um, hat, the this technical advisor role to be able to be conduits. And so those are, you know, I think holding um, a, a little bit different perspectives, really trying to design and implement 
across functional relationships across all of these bodies. So it's not investing in a disconnect, but we are investing in all being more connected and aligned. Um, and this new um, production assistant director, I'm really excited. I'm going to just go ahead and announce that um, Ty Denson Strain, who you are all, all familiar with from, um, or most of you are familiar with from uh, production uh, recommendations here in Housing Stability Council. He's been, was the successful candidate. So is um, starting uh, next week as our new assistant director of production. So really excited to have uh, that added to the team. We will be in really short short term here releasing the recruitment for this externally um largely externally facing uh pipeline and technical advisor program man or group manager um so if anybody has great uh one wants to forward that uh posting out as we get it please do um under planning and policy that's where our strategic initiatives new group will live um we constitute an operations team and i think i talked about this earlier currently um have both uh, Heather Pate and Tanya Evans engaged in this work, supporting um, right now the upfront work of NOFA engagement and the um, portfolio group. This is where we will also be constituting a new data systems team. Um, and so all of this is, uh, I just will say is large, it is uh, impactful, and um, I'm really excited to be able to step into the space where we are building the tools we think are needed to respond to the moment and to the need across the state. Um, and so then moving forward into looking at our, you know, so that's this internal work of what are we doing to make sure that we are building the structures that we need internally to be um, resilient and active in our process updates and the support that we think is needed to make sure that we are um, prioritizing uh, moving projects up and through processes and into community. Um, we have been uh, doing a pretty uh, significant uh, engagement effort. Um, I did include the link to that information in your Housing Stability Council packet. Um, on that page, you can find, you know, if you wanted to watch a recording of those sessions, there's also all of the background materials. And as we are synthesizing feedback, we are reporting that back out on that same web page as well as sending it directly to folks. Next week, we have our first, our last kind of already calendared offering underneath that umbrella with the idea that we'll be kind of signaling um, what we have heard, kind of revisiting where we are. I think probably using some of the things that I will be talking through uh, now to be able to, um, you know, get additional input, make sure that we are hearing all of the really critical messages as we go back. Um, and continue to work to take all of these different puzzle pieces of influence and, and build a future vision that addresses the critical need and as much as possible can uh, navigate identified unintended consequences of our revision and, and this work. Um, and I also think, you know, I'm saying this pretty regularly, we need to do as best as we can an excellence of engagement, trying to understand and highlight and uh, what these unintended consequences are. And I feel it's very critical that we are investing and co comfortable with the idea that as we move forward and we identify that it's not working right, we need to continue to do that, el that evaluation of what is working, what is not, and be willing to change where that's needed. Um, and so I don't wanna lock something in that we are unable to pivot if we see that there is uh, an emerging issue that that you know wasn't anticipated and we didn't know how to solve for. Um, so I will kind of in under this umbrella look at um, our you know under the you know how do we put out resources? There's really the question both about how um, we offer those, what are the processes of what we offer, and then how are the actual resources used? What are the set aside production targets? When do we, what does that calendar look like? When are resources offerings? And then what are really our policy objectives? What do we want to accomplish with this, these investments in housing? Obviously production is chief among those. And I think we know that there is a lot that can be achieved in community with housing investments and wanting to make sure as best as possible that we set up a responsive process, both to allow for innovation as well as impact into community. 
And so I included in the memo in your packet three key themes just in summary. And I wanted to unpack here, you know, what the, the bold part is. What is our intention here to respond? Um, so this will, the first thing is really this, this, this bullet point here around um, the idea that we need to give projects early clarity, like do they have a project or do they not? Will they be able to access resources? Should they continue to invest their own organizational resources or borrow resources or use our own pre-development resources to support their project goals? Um, and I think that this has been a, a pretty um, weighty conversation because we have absolutely also signaled that we need to, for our own sake of diligence and the idea of having projects that are actually able to move into production, we need to do our final funding commitment much closer to when they are ready to build. That does not mean that we are not wanting to talk to these projects until they are ready to build. And I think um, we at I've said that and it is really hard, I think, to kind of to, to process those two different pieces of reality. I think it is critical that we wait to bring that dollar to you as Housing Stability Council to approve until we just have more of those um, those box checked on what has been done to make sure that we have like close as close to viable um, as uh, projects as we have in front of us. And so this graphic here, um, this is kind of a, a picture that we've put forward. I probably used it in this space before of kind of what a total development process looks like. When you start with a project concept, you then start looking at feasibility, you put an application, you start your construction, you lease up, you operate for, you know, this is a deceptively small box for what is usually a 60 year period and a 60 year relationship. Our current NOFA process is really exclusively participating in this step three space. So projects by themselves, developers will go through their concept, they'll look at their um, early feasibility, maybe they'll give us a call and say, what do you think? And it's a really informal process. And we stack everything into this NOFA competitive space where they are telling us that they have the credentials to be able to do development, that they have secured a property that passes all of the sniff tests, that they have a financial stack that works, that they've secured all of their resources and have put that whole package together, that they formalize all of the partnerships that are needed for this, that they have prioritized tenants, that they have done all of this thing all in one package and then they get a yes or a no. That is a lot to put into one space and when you get the no, it is then a year or two years or three years before we give that opportunity to submit that application again. It worked for us for a time. I don't think it is the place that we need to be now. When we are looking forward, I would really like to value, have, I mean, we, have, we are program experts, we are financing experts, we have also become experts on competition and putting a lot of time, effort, and energy into finding out way, good ways to decide, is it a yes or is it a no? And I would really want the bulk of our staff work and the bulk of our energy be spent on figuring out how to get those units into community. And so I think the shift is of trying to accomplish both balancing that idea of readiness and pinning that final funding decision down much later and building these upfront relationships and accountability to holding relationships across this process. And so while our entire current NOFA process is just in this space, this early draft concept is um, kind of in the green box here below where we are having an, an early project intake process where projects are able to access the technical advisors, if they're eligible for pre-development funds could come in for those. They could be asking their curious questions. We could be identifying, you know what, that sounds like a great match for XYZ resource. Have you thought about doing this? This is a really constrained resource. What about looking at different types of strategies in that process? Let's talk to your city. Let's do all of that kind of upfront work in a little more of a collaborative spirit. 
Um, and then we are breaking out this assessment that currently happens in, we're seeking to break out the assessment that currently really just happens in this concentrated NOFA space to say, let's first look at how financially viable this project is. Do you have a structure that makes sense when you're layering in the resources that you're anticipating? Like, what does this look like? Do you have it? Something here. And then after they step through that process, then saying, let's look at the impact of this project. We have, we need to create a strong high bar. I'm not saying low bar, high bar around what we need our projects to accomplish in community. And I think this is where we're thinking about, you know, having those upfront very clear, I think reinforced and reiterated through our upfront technical advisor group, but also kind of evaluated here. Let's look at what you have done to engage tenants. What have you done to make sure that you are building in responsive um, supports? How are you responding to your jurisdiction's need? What is, you know, all, you know, all of these really complex dynamics, what population are you trying to serve? How are you being responsive to that and doing that evaluation? And I think there's a lot of details in that. Obviously, how that comes together has impacts on financials. So it's not a, a you know, one and done type relationship, but having this be more of a process where the entry point at each point, the point of the what you have risked to put that application forward is, is that is lessened and we are more engaged partners around that. And then again, once you have gotten all of those things through and you have your diligence list and then we give a final funding um, project commitment later on when they are just, you know, ready to say we're you know, got to the, that peak and we're going to roll out downhill sprint toward that financial closing. Um, and so I think all of that is really intended to address the site, this fact of we need to have, you know, early clarity around all of, uh, you know, whether we will be able to move forward with a project. And the intent then is that, you know, once we are, you know, go through each review process, we are able to give a conditional commitment for resources that gives clear expectations about what the need is to retain that commitment. So it's the final commitment happens a little bit later, but we are even earlier than they are able to get today, giving conditional commitments to say, we are comfortable, this passes this kind of review process, to retain your resources, you still need to accomplish all of these things. This is the timelines associated with that and move that forward. Um, I think the the these the next two, the next item is a little bit connected to this as well. They're all connected, but I'm gonna just kind of go through the next one and then pause for uh discussion. Um, and because the next one, the next theme is really about our responsiveness. And the fact, and I think, you know, the other example, I think as council member Mena was talking through the today, what is this process that individual projects have to go through to be able to get to readiness, to be able to move forward. And I think what has been, been abundantly clear to us as we've engaged both this year and as well as all of the years before is that each project's circumstances are unique. It depends where they are building, what's the community, what does the permitting timeline look there? What are the other resources being leveraged? Are there other jurisdictional resources or other funding partners? What population are they serving? What does that have <laughs> impacts to how, how they're forming partnerships, what the timelines are? Um, you know, it's a kind of the endless list. How big is the building? Does it need underground parking? Does it need street parking? What is the, the kind of lens of infrastructure need? You know, on and on. And so I think, um, you know, I think this is idea, the idea, I think kind of expressed concern that we are going to say, you do this step and then within, you know, the next week you do this and the next week you do this. I don't think, I think there's too many variables for us to be explicit and deliberate to be able to say, this is the standard that all projects must abide by. And I think we need to establish a structure of accountability to projects moving forward. And so the idea that we are kind of swirling around at the moment is to say that, you know, at each step, you know, project in, intake, early concept feedback moves into a financial eligibility review that through which they would get a conditional commitment and set up their own project specific benchmarks. So we would be able to say, 
in order to get to the next impact assessment, you need to have done X, Y, Z. Tell us when you're going to be doing X, Y, Z. And if they stay within their X, Y, Z timelines that they've identified, they continue to move forward. If we find that projects are stalled, are restarting things, are not prioritizing moving forward with projects, then we say, you know what? You're, you're not kicked out, but you're gonna have to go back and start with a new conditional commitment of resources. Let's go back, see what has changed, what is going on. I think, um, you know, it's, I'm not sure how chronic the issue is, but I think we certainly do have a, um, you know, when we're looking at our pipeline on, on, on our production analyst desks, seems to be some projects where by, by virtue of our, you know, our NOFA process, or the way that organizations are working community, a feeling of collecting reservations. I'm gonna collect a reservation for 10 projects and then in six months, I'll start on that one. And then in six months, I'll start on that one. Let's start, let's do the work as we go. Let's bring projects that are viable and let's not occupy a lot of resources to projects that are not moving forward. Um, and so again, wanting to do this in a way that is responsive to project needs to be able to say, Create your own benchmarks. Tell us what your timelines are. I think we should have some broad parameters around those. There's a lot of details there. But again, we can give conditional commitments. You can set up project-specific benchmarks for retaining those commitments and moving forward and um, set up a process where if you do need to change your strategy, we have a way in live time to walk back and remove it forward. And so not a, a situation where you missed that NOFA, sorry, see you in two years. Um, and so I think, you know, really setting up that dynamic of that. I think, again, the role of public funders and jurisdictions in this process is incredibly impactful. Um, even those jurisdictions without local funding resources, I think bringing them into the loop and into the conversation, how are they engaging with the project, supporting that project locally, um, you know, balancing that with NIMBY that could, again, in some cases be ju jurisdictionally supported will be a concern within that. But I think really offering the opportunity and deliberate roles around um, that relationship. And I have a little bit more to unpack, but I think I will pause there with enough uh, information <laughs> talked at you um, to see if there's uh, thoughts or input that um, anybody would like to bring forward. Council members, the floor is yours. Council member Mena to be followed by council member Rogers. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I actually really appreciate the process um, as it's laid out. Um, definitely we need to do things differently than what we've been doing because it, it's not working and uh, trying something different that hopefully provides some more clarity early on and as the project moves forward uh, makes sense uh, and you know it's all about implementation but um, I, I, I just gotta say tremendous amount of work and it, it sounds and looks like something that would work. Um, always the challenge is funding and you know there's a once we get into the true commitment of funds and you get it more demand than the resources, there's always going to be a conversation about that. But um, the early on process and the access to pre-development funds is, is always good. So um, yeah, it looks good. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Rogers. Yes, I'd, I'd like to say I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and the revamping of the process. I think it is imperative to communicate early on with a particular agency so that they know where they are. I like the fact that we're trying to put this technical assistance in place to help along the way. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to add is that internally, we need to come up with uh, a metric to figure out if this is really being successful. Um, to me, uh, success would look like everybody who was helped with technical assistance walked away with a successful award. Um, so if we could um, track that in some sort of 
of way so that again we're learning as we go because the ultimate goal to me should be ensuring that everyone is at least awarded a project i mean i know that we're constrained by particular resources but i think having that information would be additional data to say hey we did x with these amount of dollars can you give us a larger award so we can be more successful and do more projects in the future thanks hey council member lee thank you chair hall um I'll join my colleagues in just expressing how uh, aspirational this looks and feels and all of that comes with that. And I think that's wonderful. So uh, congratulations uh, to you and to the team for the work that went behind this. And it feels big, it feels aspirational. And with that comes some risks. So I'm gonna, and, and I have uh, two sets of questions or comments. So I'm gonna start with the more detailed pieces. Um, it would be helpful to understand in some of the charts that you've shown for the process, when does the project come to the council and for what purpose, right? We've had some discussions about by the time the project gets to the council, if we've got questions, it's too late, right? Because we've gone too far down the path. And really at that point, we're just trying to be, you know, accountability for staff, uh, you know, for a staff oversight with that, right? Uh, but all of the other discernment work has happened by the time a project gets to us, and it's virtually impossible not to accept the recommendations of staff. Not that we would ever not do that. However, we're talking about engaging ourselves more. Uh, it would be interesting for us to see, uh, Natasha, where you would put coming into the council for what purposes? I mean, is there an early review role for us or you know, like coming attractions or is it we're in the appropriate place right now and this is part of what our role is as DOJ has told us and so that's what it's gonna be. So some, some information about where the council comes into the process and for what purpose. I would um, very, very strongly um, uh, support seeing all of the, the language that you talked about uh, related to racial justice and equity reflected in the graphics, the visuals, the narrative, right? So uh, the work you all doing, I think has such integrity and I respect the efforts and I would love to see it more clearly reflected, not simply as a part of our talking points. And, and when we engage, it's absolutely there. I think there's a lot more room to be able to get there more explicitly. And in service to that, uh, I think even it was the, let me see if this is the right chart that's up. Yes. So uh, I would like to see financial eligibility be at the same level as racial justice eligibility. So mm -hmm. that when we are looking in these in the first uh, squares of project benchmarks, that we are assessing these projects very early on, both for their financial uh, capacity, but also for their racial justice and equity capacity, because we know we get to the end and people say, well, I'm going to try. Um, or right. I'm, I intend, I've talked to a couple of organizations and I intend to get uh, an MOU signed with them or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, and sometimes that is sincere reflection of where people are at. And sometimes it feels a little checkboxy because yeah. they know they have to tell us these things. So uh, for me, the racial justice and equity work commitment uh, manifestation, whatever we want to investment is as equal importance to the financial eligibility. And I would like to see, you know, at least this chart that we're on now or, or some of the other charts put that in there. So it's this, it's sort of like a corollary to what I just asked. Let's describe more what we're talking about related to racial justice and equity. And then in the process, let us make it as equally important to us as the financial information. Um, and I put that out there knowing that that's a, a, a little controversial. Uh, and I believe if we don't, we're not gonna get to the places we need to get to. And then finally, um, these are more internal questions. I would love to see some information that track the staff demographics, both before, like what we have currently, and how we fill those deputy director positions and how we fill the new positions uh, with the understanding that the goal is to increase the diversity uh, by race and ethnicity and other intersectional identities of this team overall and also in the leadership positions. Um, you know, we've, we had, was it last month or the month before, we had some demographic information presented to us from the human resources group. I would love to see in specificity as we uh, walk into this very aspirational and um, uh, 
aspirational, right? Uh, visionary uh, plan. How is that reflected in the people that were getting into these key positions? And then finally, uh, Natasha, I, it, again, in sort of the spirit of asking, what about this plan gives you the greatest, um, uh, where you think you're taking the greatest risks, keeps you up at night thinking about it, uh, it has some, you know, your stomach hurts when you think about, well, this could go really great or this could go really wrong. And then I would also love to hear, it doesn't have to be today, uh, where are you most excited as the leader of this group and responsible for this? Or what are you like? Yes, I can't wait for us to get this implemented. So I'd like to just hear those two things if we have time and, and you're up for it. Thank you. Absolutely. I think maybe I will round on those two questions after, um, after the balance of comment, both to give myself more time, but also uh, do that to round us out with here. Thank you so much. Council Member Defentorum. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, thank you, Natasha, for your presentation. And thank you, uh, Council Member Lee, for your comments. Um, very similar to what I've been thinking when I read through the packet. I think it's fantastic that we have the REIT tool and that we're evaluating applications and like starting to build into the framework um, all of this criteria, but what do we actually do with it? That's the question I always have. It's, it's good that we have information, but is that really informing how we're making funding decisions? And I don't know if it was as you suggested, Mary, that maybe they're coming to us late and reviewing early on. I don't know if that's the answer, but I really appreciate you raising that um, issue because it's the same question I have every month when I read through the packet. It's like, this is really good information, but is it really informing our decision-making and how funds are allocated? So um, thanks again for raising that. Absolutely. And I think that that is um, really incredible input at this specific point where we haven't baked it, right? I mean, I think, um, because I do think the place where we are bringing projects at this, you know, project commitment place, we are saying they've done all of this and we have said yes a few times. And so what is it from a process standpoint that will allow um, input and reflection of Housing Stability Council values and engagement around this earlier and in different ways? And so I think... Um, that will is unanswered and remains on the list to be answered. Um, I think through all of it, I did. Um, you know, I think there's one other theme that I we uh, included in the memo is really around like the what is it that we are doing and how are we making these decisions? And I think it really comes um, from a perspective of how do we um, step into this in a way that builds intentional connections and um, to what we want to accomplish. And I think, you know, as we were just talking around set asides, uh, Council Member Lee on the PSH risk mitigation um, pool and how that works and how that could operate, I think similarly trying to think about from a, a broader project funding perspective when we're bringing all resources under one umbrella of an offering. There's different, I mean, we do have, you know, I think Ed talked through, we have veterans dedicated GHAP resources. So obviously veteran resources would support veteran unit. Our ag worker resources would support ag housing, PSH, chronic homeless households. And then the rest of it, what is it that we want to prioritize center and protect through set asides? And I'm I think around, you know, as we put this into action and we've, you know, done some engagement on set asides, what is that that feels impactful? Really thinking about the role of a set aside. And I think we've gotten, you know, across all of our NOFAs um, that we have done just a really big mix of what set-asides are used for, often geographic, so rural versus urban or regional beyond that, or um, set-aside to do small projects versus big projects versus, uh, you know, what are the different types of things? And so thinking about set-asides, you know, as we're kind of, what, kind of exploring this curiosity is what is it, like if, if the set aside is intended to accomplish making sure that you have access opportunity to achieve a specific thing, um, I'm just really curious to get, you know, Housing Stability Council thoughts on 
what are the types of investments that you think we need to make sure to protect? Um, and so I think that, you know, again, location, project types, target populations, the partnership types, is it, you know, is it impact, meaningful? I mean, I think obviously we've talked a lot around culturally specific organizations, tribal communities, wanting to make sure that we can protect that space of, of, of access so that there is um, not a, well, you know, the that urban developer runs faster than, and so let's make sure that we are working a process to, to respect and um, honor the, the work of community that those organizations do. And so, yeah, we'll just pause here if there's additional comments specific uh, to this question. Council? Okay. I guess we can keep going then. Okay. Oh, oh, wait a minute, Council Member Lee. Well, I, I think I already uh, uh, responded to this uh, question earlier, but I'll just say it again. I think we want geographic set aside uh, for rural priorities. And I think we want set aside uh, uh, that uh, is part of our racial justice and equity work. So yeah. culturally specific, uh, I think a number of the target populations and the partnership types can fit underneath the uh, racial justice and equity piece uh, as the, is in the statewide housing plan and in other manifestations that you have organizing here. And I think keeping it sim as simple as we can, because uh, we've seen where we've gotten too complex. And so, you know, first you apply this screen and then depending yeah. on the result of that, you apply the, you know, there's sort of like this tree that starts to grow exponentially. For me, if we could uh, privilege work and resources into rural areas and work and resources into projects where uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are centered by, for, and about, uh, we'd be doing great. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's helpful. If others have thoughts later on, certainly um, send them my way. And so I think then I will pivot to answering your two big questions, Council Member Lee, and um, doing a little bit of look forward kind of thought. I think, um, you know, so first, you know, what's the biggest risk among this? I think wanting to make sure that we are anticipating as much of the unintended consequences and really being responses is a critical need. I don't actually lose sleep over that because I think we have an incredibly thoughtful engagement strategy. We have an amazing work of, of a body of work that um, countless numbers of the team are supporting and doing that to really detail and think through the impacts of the input that we are receiving, synthesizing that, understanding themes, and really what we're walking it through in terms of really responsive connections across those. And so I don't want to underestimate that work. That is huge. And I have confidence it's happening. I think I really have care and concern internally around our staff and the, the roles that we have. We have um, you know, I do. We have a team that is not going to compromise on their on values, which is exactly what we need. I think it is not a concern to me that we are going to step away from equity and racial justice impacts. I think we are um, digging in on education. We are um, feeling the impact of being able to have those active conversations internally, and then also with partners. And as we are exploring projects, and so I think again, needing to keep a highlighted focus on it, but I. Don't don't think that's a risk, but I do worry about how we need to navigate change and do it well. Um, and I think to that end, trying to build in as much supports as possible to that. Um, and I think if we could pause the rest of the world for six months and just do that alone, we would feel wonderful. And um, we can't do that. And that's not an opportunity. And so we are, again, we've, I'm, we're launching with two big change management support efforts internally focusing on the portfolio side, asset management compliance, which is not something that we brought into the space yet. I think in the future will, but how do we really invest in a strong foundation and relationship with each other in that long-term 60-year space of a lot of tricky situations with our portfolio um, and in that work? And then this upfront work that we really, you know, walking through here today, this is 
you know, I, again, I think in my ideal land, I would have done this, you know, a year engagement internally with staff before getting to the idea of requesting positions. And that's not what we have. And so we are, you know, experiencing getting what is the comfort with the discomfort of it, the uncertainty and the unknown. And I really, I, I, we need, I need to, so I think that's the place and I won't continue, but I feel like the, the idea that we need to spend the time and attention to really hear from the people that do the work to make sure that as we are getting the details and into the weeds of all of the things that we set up, um, respectful ways of doing that work, having those difficult trade-off conversations. And I think, you know, with all of that, I have reframed it in my mind to be op incredible opportunities um, to do things well and do things different. Um, and I think where I am, and so, you know, most excited, I'm excited about all of it. Honestly, the idea of being able to have deliberate, dedicated roles to be able to have the proactive conversations where I'm not adding that to someone else's plate, but it is somebody's responsibility that feels like that will be incredible. I'm excited to be able to really offer that support to be able to, um, you know, have uh, right size roles and make sure that we are really having robust uh, leadership over all of these spaces where when you're juggling 50 different things, that's not possible to do. Um, and so I think those are all really exciting opportunities. And I think, you know, as this kind of bleeds over into looking forward, what are the production concepts? I feel like this is a, an amazing opportunity. Under executive order, we need to increase production. We know it has come here a lot. We have constrained resources. We have recently um, put out a resource, um, you know, an opportunity for private activity bonds that generate 4% tax credits. We had 250 million to offer. We got applications for over 700 million. And those are all projects that would be ready to move now if they had the resources or within the year. And that is... I guess that keeps me up at night. <laughs> and the opportunity is to think about this is an opportunity to really think about how do we expand production within our reality of our constrained resources and the idea that we cannot continue to leverage that same resource to get all projects built. And that as we have incredible opportunity and alignment from the governor and the legislature investing in affordable renting housing, rental housing development, how is it that we move these through? And so I just have a couple slides and it's very detailed. I can make sure that get this to Shalow so we can post it and send it out. Um, but I think, you know, thinking about there's kind of four big buckets of thinking that we are working around, you know, thinking about what are our future concepts and how do we want to think strategically about putting um, work, stepping up and stepping into the space of production demands. I think, you know, we are reflecting a lot of these pieces in the work that we are talking through today in terms of expanding the future pipeline of development projects and prioritizing long-term operations. We have land acquisition resources. We could, should continue to have land acquisition resources. We need this upfront technical uh, um, assistance. We need relationship management. Um, we need to think about tenant supports that, you know, are aligned with supporting tenants where they are now. And I think across our portfolio really here, a struggle for vice, for sustainability is that they don't have that, you know, it might not be chronic homeless households needing supportive tenancy services, but certainly resident services and referrals are in, insufficient to meet the time and, and insufficient to meet tenant needs. And so what is that middle ground look like and how do we make sure that we can finance it? I think we have some programmatic recommendations or thoughts around how could we retool some of our ZIX existing programs to support that work. Um, expanding, you know, obviously the construction workforce, and I think there are groups engaged around that, and property management. I think we also hear that those come up through our Housing Stability Council meetings, in our public testimony, 
property management is a foundational part of being able to operate affordable housing. There are complex rules, there are requirements. These are oftentimes tenants with a lot of needs and issues going on in their projects and wanting to make sure that we have really responsive and active leadership in project property management across the state. And we have many and there's not enough. And so how do we continue to invest in building um, uh, uh, property management across the state, as well as, you know, thinking about building the building, it's operating the building. Um, looking to reduce barriers, I think we, you know, again, this is a pretty uh, aligned agenda that we brought you today, mm -hmm. but infrastructure costs and uh, where are we in our affordable housing investments having putting jurisdictions in a in a position where they need to in, increase their local infrastructure um and they don't have resources to do it and we don't have resources to do it we are our resources should be largely dedicated to expanding the building itself there's related infrastructure and that kind of those bounds start to press so how can we do some alignment of that and how can we be bringing all of the agencies across the state enterprise to that conversation and to that table um you know by expanding BIPOC developer um community I think this is maybe a year uh or so ago but you know certainly national coverage of the uh, uh, presence of BIPOC developers housing developers and there just really are not many if any in the state and how do can we invest in increasing and um, or creating and increasing investing in those emerging groups that would be able to really have broad impact across the state and in their communities. Um, and really just, I think we've had some strategic conversations with existing real estate trainings, education and others, and how do we, you know, how does that as a, as a state kind of align and how do we wanna continue to work um, to make sure that we're taking advantage of all of those opportunities. Um, and then uh, uh, this has gotten long, I apologize, but we want to think we're looking toward uh, ideas and thoughts around serving broader income levels. How is it that when we, you know, in this market space where we are um, wanting, you know, I think as a housing finance agency and working in finance, needing to be responsive to market. Um, and part of this is a market deficit also in the 80 to 120 AMI space um, where we don't currently operate. And so where is it that we might be able to step into that, both to support community need, but also as an opportunity to diversify the, the AMI mix within buildings to better support sustainability, be better leverage some of our creative resource financing resources that might require less gap subsidy, how can we expand tenant rent assistance, which we know is what is needed to really support affordability. Um, and then looking to, you know, in that financing space, really looking to diversify the funding tools um, and create some sustainable perspectives on resources. How can we be reinvesting in our portfolio projects? How can we be using um, strategies like 501c3 bonds that don't require private activity bond authority to do some of that work. Um, and so again, I know that was a lot. Again, happy to follow up in uh, with a copy of uh, this list. But I think, you know, as I'm, what is really most exciting, it is thinking about planning forward. That excites me. I think the idea of looking at strategies that are resilient, flexible, and impactful to be able to bring impact to community across the state. And that is um, the end of my uh, presentation on that, Chair Hall. Um, I don't know if any council members have input, but also happy to continue the conversation later. Council? Well, I'll jump in and say, you know, this is great. I think this is starting not just a conversation, but a lot of conversations we need to have. And one of the many thoughts uh, bumping around in my mind right now is even if we were flat funded, this would represent a major step forward in improving our process. But with the way uh, our funding is... Uh, exponentially expanding, I think having this improved framework in place will be a big, big asset, making sure the money is spent 
intentionally and uh, and in the way we want it. So, council, any final words? I guess not. So, Natasha, thank you to your you and your team for a great discussion. And uh, at this point, eleven fifty five, we will take a 15 minute recess uh, for our break and reconvene at 12:10. back in. We're recording again. So we're officially reconvened and we're up to the homeownership division presentation. Are you folks ready, uh, Mr. Director? Yes. Okay. Floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Hall, prestige members of the Housing Stability Council, and Director Bell. I am Keeble Jiscom, he, him, his pronouns, and I'm the Director of Home Ownership Division here at OHCS. Today, we, we will be presenting two lift proposal. The first item will be the, the lift home ownership increase that will, that will be presented by Ms. Jessica McKinnon, our Senior Home Ownership Development Program and Analyst. And the second item will be presented by our new Assistant Director of Home Ownership Programs, Ms. Talia Can Carvis, and she will be presenting LIF Home Ownership and LIF Supplemental Framework. Thank you for your time, and with no further delay, here is Ms. McKinnon. You're on mute, Jessica. Thank you so much. Uh, one moment while I get my presentation up. Uh, well, good afternoon, and thank you for having me here today. I'm Jessica McKinnon. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Senior Homeownership Development Program Analyst. I'm here today to request funding increases for three of our Lyft homeownership projects. I presented last month for the first of five increase recommendations. I've added some additional facts here on the slide, but to quickly summarize, we had $760,000 remaining from the 2023 NOFA, that was not needed for lift rental. We offered these funds to 2022 and 2023 recipients whose appraisals came back higher than expected on a first come first serve basis. Applicants were still required to comply with all of the rules set forth in their NOFA, such as maximum award amounts um, and allowable developer fees. And these funds came with an additional deadline to close their loan. We don't anticipate providing an opportunity like this again, as moving forward, we'll be requiring appraisals to be complete at application. We received six applications. One was denied for not meeting the qualifications. You approved one last month, and we have since closed on that loan. Um, I'm presenting three today, and we plan on bringing the final one to you at the December meeting. Now, before I dive into the projects and requests, I'm excited to introduce what I've been calling our one slider. Um, moving forward, whenever we bring anything project specific to you for approval, we want to provide you with a more comprehensive, uh, more comprehensive information about each project. So we've set up this template to provide you with a selection of key information about each project, including the unit details, financing information, um, and some key highlights from the equity and project narratives, and also a brief description about the developer. So this first request is for Daily Estates, a development by Bend Redmond Habitat for Humanity approved in our 2022 NOFA. It's a nine unit development of three bed, two bath townhomes, which was awarded $986,100 in 2022. Their application listed a sales price that may seem a little higher than you would expect, um, but these prices will almost certainly be much lower by sale. They follow the habitat model, so their ultimate sales price will be reflective of what the home buyer can afford. Uh, the land will be shovel ready at purchase, meaning that they'll be able to get started quickly. The site is close to schools and amenities, and every unit will have a desirable open plan living, dining, and kitchen space. 
Uh, ben Redmond Habitat has been a longstanding lift partner and has a substantial history in affordable housing development. They have uh, great community relationships and outreach partners, including Neighbor Impact, the Latino Community Association, Central Oregon Veterans Association, schools, churches, and volunteers. Their work has identified a community need for long-term affordability, energy efficiency, community, and a peaceful environment, which this development seeks to address. They're committed to engaging MWESB partners through a detailed procurement policy, and they do have a staff member focusing on the implementation and tracking of that, policy, of that policy and their COVID requirements. We're requesting an additional $48,900, which is $5,433 per unit. This will bring their total lift award to $1,035,000 for 115,000 per unit. The second development is the King City Project by Habitat for Humanity Portland Region, which was awarded 1.6 million in 2022. This partners work with the community identified a gap in affordable family-sized homes that are suitable for larger or multi-generational households. This development seeks to address that gap. It's a 16 unit townhome development of larger family-sized homes both three and four bedroom that will also follow the habitat sales model and be sold at prices affordable to their buyers. They'll be building their development with a private community green space to facilitate community development and all of their units will meet visitability standards. Habitat for Humanity Portland region is another longstanding partner of our lift program and have been serving the Portland region for over 40 years. They've committed to improving equity in the Portland region and through their work have developed a vast network of community and local partners, including Vienna Star, the Native American Youth and Facility, or the Native American Youth and Family Center, the African American Alliance for Homeownership, Hacienda CDC, and Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon. We're requesting an additional $120,000, which is $7,500 per unit. This will bring their total lift award to $1,720,000 or 107500 per unit. Our last request is for the Twin Oaks development by Umpqua Valley Habitat for Humanity. This is a rural development of six detached homes in Riddle, Oregon, sold at prices affordable to local residents. We were able to support this development thanks to the lift supplemental offering this year. We awarded them $150,000 in lift funds and $930,000 in those supplemental funds. These six houses are part of a larger development site in a wildfire disaster area and will be fully adaptable for home buyers that may need additional accessibility. Umpqua Valley Habitat for Humanity is a first time partner with Lyft and have also received a pre-development and capacity building award to expand their staff and support pre-development work on other projects. They're established and supported in the rural communities they serve and consider community informed design on the homes and projects. Uh, one third of those served by this organization identify as Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, or persons of color, and every community served is considered rural. They're committed to improving MWESB participation in their projects and currently work often with a woman owned electrician. We're requesting an additional $60,000, which is 10,000 per unit. This will bring their total lift award to 210,000 or 35,000 per unit. Their lift supplemental award will, be, will remain unchanged. And this final slide is a summary of funding received and funding requested for each project. I've highlighted the requested increase and the new total lift awards in red. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions from the council? Any kind of discussion or feedback? Uh, council Member Lee, then Council Member Rogers. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to appreciate the visual um, slide deck that you all use to go through here. Very, very helpful. Um, really lets us see the uh, you know sort of the valuable the important points easily and i think helps uh frame the presentation and discussion so i think it's just fabulous i know you all have been working on it uh to figure it out and i just want to say thank you i appreciate it thank you so much council member rogers i'd like to echo um council member lee's um kudos for the slide yes it, template is very helpful 
helpful and I, I liked it. I have a question about the mechanics. And so these particular projects were awarded funding in the 2022. And now we're giving them more money because we have additional funding. So my question is, if the project has already closed and been completed, what um, were the criteria for the additional increase? I mean, are we, um, what is it that we're subsidizing, I guess, is what my question is. Sure. So uh, none of these projects have actually closed yet. Um, some of them are waiting on, um, maybe some of them are on administrative tasks. Uh, one, one good example is the Daily Estates project. Since they will be purchasing the site shovel ready, they're waiting on the site to be shovel ready before they can purchase it. And we can't close on the lift loan until um, until they actually have the sites. Uh, have okay, that, have okay. That site. so, so we just mm -hmm. had already awarded them money earlier, but the project hasn't been completed. They're still waiting to start the projects. Exactly. Okay, and, got it, um, thank you. The, oh, of course. Anything further from the council here? If not, uh, our proposed motion is on page 53 of the packet. Uh, move the motion. Thanks. Need a second, please. Second. Roll call, please. Thank you, Chair Hall. Council Member DeFantorum. Yes. Council Member Farrell. Yes. Chair Hall. Yes. Council Member Lee. Yes. Council Member Mena. Yes. Council Member Rogers? Yes. Thank you, motion passes. Okay. On to the next item. Good morning or good afternoon, Chair Hall, Council Members and Director Bell. My name is Talia Concravis and I use she, her pronouns and I'm the Assistant Director of Homeownership Programs. And I just wanna make sure before I go any further, can you see my screen? Okay, great. <laughs> um, I'm here to share some updates about our homeownership development programs, primarily LIFT, as well as to discuss the funding framework for the coming year, sorry. We're interested in hearing your feedback at the end of the presentation and hopefully this frog in my throat will go away. First, I'll start with some updates on the impact of the LIFT program so far. And many of you are already familiar with the LIFT program. Um, OHCS released the first LIFT homeownership notice of funding availability, or as we call it, NOFA, in 2018. Since then, the amount of funding available for to homeownership development, <laughs> excuse me, one second. Sure. <laughs> Since then, the amount of funding to homeownership developers has grown each year, and the amount we've dispersed has grown, except for 2021, which, as we all know, was the heart of uncertainty during the pandemic. We now have 17 unique developers accessing LIFT loans. We have 40 projects underway, eight that are completed and have home buyers moving in, and still some are in the process of selling homes and completing homes. Combined, these developments will result in 752 new permanently affordable homes throughout the state, which an estimated 1,700 people will call home. So I wanted to show a bit of the demographic distribution of these projects. There are lift projects in 13 different counties, as you can see, mostly concentrated on the western side of the state. Despite having a 50% rural set aside in each NOFA, Overall, only 23% of lift projects are in rural areas. It's worth noting that in 2023, this shifted a bit. 
47% uh, of the projects funded were in rural areas. And this is likely due to the availability of lift supplemental funding for the first time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that source in a bit. And this graphic is taken from our homeownership dashboard, which is publicly available. So, so sorry. 40 lift homes are complete, and we have 90 residents in those homes, 42 of whom are children or dependents. The average household size is 2.25. And uh, while we collect demographic data on these residents, I'll caveat that there's a lot of missing data here since not everybody wants to share this information and our form is optional. We're also in the process of revamping the forms to better capture the different identities of the residents. So, Next time we present this data, you might see some new categories on here and, and hopefully more robust data collection. But from what we have of the adults in those households, just over half identify as female, most of whom are the heads of their household. 12% identify as Hispanic or Latino, Latinx, Latina, and 24% are people of color. And so in 2022, we were able to substantially expand our homeownership development offerings with the use of general funds. For the first time, we had funds to provide deeper subsidy in lift projects, as well as to fund other types of projects. And um, the council was integral to helping us develop and give feedback on the different categories of funding. So we use these funds to create a homeownership market cost offset fund to keep 11 lift projects on track that were facing hardship due to the volatility of the pandemic. We awarded funding to five different tribes to spur more homeownership opportunities in their community, helped 14 organizations build capacity and begin pre-development activities, which we expect to lead to more shovel-ready homeownership projects down the line. We funded seven non-shared equity projects, taking a culturally responsive approach to development and supplemented lift projects to decrease the barriers to leveraging lift, particularly for rural projects. And this last fund is what we actually have funding for in this coming year. And so we'll talk more about that. So while we're proud of the work, of our development partners to build long lasting affordable homes for Oregonians with, lift and with low incomes, Lyft is not without its challenges. I'll name a few here. Uh, I think we've discussed many of these before council in the past, but because of the requirements of Article 11 Q bonds, the state must maintain an operational or ownership interest in land. And for home ownership, this limits projects to shared equity home ownership models where a nonprofit owns the land and the homeowner owns the home. This enables the state to take a first lien on the land. Also, lift funds can't be used on tribal land since tribal land is sovereign and not considered state land. We can work with tribal developers off tribal land, but the need for the state to take an ownership interest in the land is typically and rightly so a non-starter for the tribes. While applicants can qualify for up to $20,000, $200,000 per home, it's rare that they do since the lift award cannot exceed the appraised value of the land, including infrastructure and site work, but excluding housing structures. As Sarah Padilla from Habitat Oregon testified this morning, this disadvantages rural projects, which have land that appraises low but face high construction costs. So that supplemental is often really important. And while lift is based on the appraised value of the land, this land can't be over collateralized. So the lift loan, since many developers want to maximize their lift loan, finding construction financing that aligns with the lift terms can be challenging. As lift grows and so do the scale of projects, the need for outside financing uh, also grows. So this is becoming a bigger issue. These are challenges that our partners, OHCS and DOJ, have grappled with since the inception of the program. However, as the program expands, it's going through growing pains. We're working to make sure the funded projects can move forward and uh, through the closing process smoothly. Simultaneously, we are also undergoing a reassessment of program documents and guidelines in collaboration with DOJ and our partners. And we're hopeful that once we have a more once we have more standardized documents 
and expectations established, the program will work better for everybody. So with that context in mind, I'll shift to talking about LIF for 2024. For 2024, we have 40 million in Article 11 Q bonds and 5 million in general funds that will be used as LIF supplemental grants. The primary goals of LIFT Home Ownership Program are mostly unchanged from prior years with some additions. Uh, the goals are to increase access to general wealth, generational wealth building through home ownership by creating new affordable home ownership homes for purchase that serve historically underserved communities, especially communities of color, foster increased home ownership opportunities in rural areas and greater density in urban areas, serve families by prioritizing family size units, encourage innovative models of affordable housing that can be widely replicated and built within 36 months. Um, some additional goals for the 2024 NOFA include supporting developments that reflect the needs of the communities they seek to serve through community informed design, support energy efficient and climate resilient homes, and support homeownership support the entire homeownership development pipeline growth by keeping the NOFA pr process accessible to culturally specific small, rural, and emerging developers. So how will we achieve this? Here's our, here are the strategies that we want to present and share. Um, a broad change that we're undergoing is that we are shifting from a closed competitive NOFA with a 60-day turnaround time to a rolling NOFA that will be open for applications from January to September 2024. This change is based on partner feedback. A rolling NOFA will give partners more time to prepare quality shovel-ready applications and better align their applications with the build schedule of the project. This will hopefully result in quicker closings, smoother program operation, and more timely outcomes. And we also believe that this approach will increase our number of applications from culturally specific organizations, smaller rural and emerging applicants. Uh, OHCS will be able to provide support to applicants throughout the application process since it won't be a competitive process. And then for those that have received an initial application rejection, uh, we can work with them on how to improve their applications so they can resubmit within the NOFA period. So I'll talk about the rest of these strategies on the next few slides. Um, a key, key to our NOFA success is uh, stakeholder engagement. We started stakeholder engagement throughout the last NOFA and at the end of the NOFA, um, we compiled lessons learned on what to do differently and held several debriefs with partners on what they would like to see changed and so have tried to incorporate as much of that feedback into the development of our new NOFA. We host quarterly partner calls where the NOFA has been the main topic of conversation and we've had some um, additional NOFA focus engagement sessions in the fall to update partners and gather feedback in real time as we develop the NOFA. And over the summer, we issued a pretty in-depth survey to partners on potential changes to the LIFT program. And we're really thankful for all the um, really generous feedback that they spent time uh, submitting to us. And it provided critical information about which changes would impose major barriers to their projects and which could help their projects be successful. And so we've taken that all into account. And then during this time, we've also been meeting individually with culturally specific organizations and rural partners. A few takeaways from those conversations include that some culturally specific organizations are not interested in the shared equity home ownership model. So this really prevents them from engaging with our home ownership development program because it's all lift focused right now. Um, this even includes some that we were able to fund last year, but won't be coming back again this year. Uh, smaller organizations or organizations new to home ownership often face skepticism from their board about the ability to make home ownership financing work. So there's some work to be done in that area. Uh, for our new criteria, which I'll go into in a bit, new organizations are a bit worried about showing that they're experienced, that they have experience to do the work when they don't have that experience on paper. So we're thinking through how we 
um, are still inclusive and mitigate that risk. And then excitingly, I'll end with the good news on this slide, um, some culturally specific organizations that we haven't worked with before actually have already acquired land and are ready to apply for a homeownership project. They, we're just seeing that they need support navigating the application process, which we can now help with, and then also ensuring that they have the infrastructure set up for the shared equity homeownership model. And we have some really experienced partners out there that can help with that part. So next in our strategies um, are having really well-defined application criteria. Uh, so applications will be re reviewed on a first come first serve basis and must meet preliminary requirements to move on to scoring and OHCS has always published our scoring criteria. This year we're hoping to be really descriptive about the criteria, ideally to the point that it, the applicants can almost score themselves uh, so they know what the expectations are and what the outcomes might be coming into the process. Um, and that was something that Natasha talked about a bit before. Uh, we vetted these updated criteria with partners and internally with staff focused on internalizing racial equity and in approaches throughout all our programs. There are six categories of questions and information that will be evaluated and applicants must meet minimum scoring in each to be recommended for funding. Uh, so the capacity criteria will look at whether the applicant has the staffing and resources in place to complete the project, given their pipeline of projects and organizational finances and stability. Development experience will look at indicators such as the organization's history of completing projects of similar size and scope, the experience of the staff and partnerships that they bring in to add additional expertise to the project. Equity and community engagement will look at the applicant's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion within their own organizational practices, how they've integrated community-centered design into the project, uh, their MWESB contracting plans, and how they plan to outreach to and to support home buyers throughout the entire pre and post purchase process. So we're really asking questions that get at all the steps along the way to really understand that process. Uh, financial viability looks to make sure the project financing is committed, the pro forma is balanced, the project is cost effective, and its funding will be sufficient to weather unexpected economic shocks. The project details category looks at how the project is situated and designed to serve the community in essential ways, for instance, are the homes built with universal design for accessibility? Do they incorporate fire resistant materials or energy efficient building techniques and other types of characteristics? And then last but not least, we'll look at the applicant's stewardship experience. And this is a new category for us uh, to ensure that they have the infrastructure in place to manage the shared equity leases in perpetuity. There's a more in-depth version of our scoring categories included on page 64 of your packet, but know that the final version published in our NOFA will be a lot more descriptive than what's in your packet, and we'll have guidance on the scoring for each criteria. So next, we will have a set aside for culturally specific organizations, small, emerging, and rural applicants. And it's meant to ensure that the first come first serve process is rolled out equitably and a few large projects don't eat away the funds right away. So 50% of the funds will be set aside until June 2024. At that point, um, if they have gone unused, we will likely roll them into the larger pool of funds to be accessible for everybody. But throughout the whole NOFA process, we will maintain um, a slightly lower scoring threshold for culturally specific organizations, small, emerging, and rural applicants that allows us to be sure that their project will be successful, but doesn't, um, they don't have to score as high as some more experienced and established developers. Not that those are mutually exclusive between um, some of those categories. And then last, we have um, a key ingredient here, which is the 5 million in general funds that must be paired with lift projects. And so um, these funds will be incorporated as part of the 
homeownership development incubator program as lift supplemental grants with a priority for projects serving communities that have been historically excluded from homeownership and projects in rural areas. Since the 5 million is uh, not much, doesn't go super far in the construction world, we have been trying to strike a balance of using these funds to provide meeting, meaningful subsidies in the projects that need the funding and align with our goals, but also have enough funds to go around to support multiple projects and developers so that distributional equity. Our project, our partners were very helpful in determining how to strike that balance, and we landed on specific per home and per entity project caps, which you can see here. We have higher caps for culturally specific organizations and rural applicants, and then for the other qualifying small emerging, small and emerging applicants, there's a little bit of a lower cap. Um, and projects won't need to submit an additional application for these funds. They just need to qualify for their lift project and indicate that they're interested in this deeper subsidy. So uh, coming next, so we have our presentation and discussion with Housing Civility Council today. We'll take whatever feedback um, you provide and plug it into the development of our NOFA. We're uh, we have ongoing collaboration with the Department of Justice to identify project risk factors that have implications for NOFA requirements and the underwriting process so that we can make sure we're also building that into the NOFA. And then we'll um, soon be submitting the NOFA to the Department of Justice for legal sufficiency. Uh, we'll return to council if needed for framework approval in December, uh, hopefully have legal sufficiency for the NOFA by the end of December, and then publish the NOFA in January, host yeah. initial information sessions, and then on an ongoing basis, we'll be hosting office hours on the NOFA and be um, able to provide support. We'll receive and evaluate the applications and then um, come to council with recommendations on an ongoing basis, but at a minimum of three times. Uh, the NOFA closes to applicants in September, and so by November, we'll be making our final recommendations of those last projects that have filtered into Housing Stability Council. So a few questions, uh, and feel free to chime in with questions that aren't these questions. Uh, I see a typo here, but while the criteria listed in this memo are high level, do you have suggestions for additional indicators that we should be using to evaluate projects? What else would council want to see in our framework or evaluation process to feel confident about our application reviews prior to us bringing them forth to you as recommendations uh, when they've when we've gone through that evaluation process? Uh, do the targeted lift supplemental criteria strike a balance of funding a diversity of projects and providing a meaningfully deeper amount of subsidy in specific projects and developers? Is there anything else the council wants to know or recommend about LIFT or HDIP fund use goals or outcomes? And are you interested in us coming back next month for official approval on this? Council? Ball's in our court now. Council member Defentorum. Chair Hall. Um, could you please explain to me, um, or maybe not explain to me, but repeat um, the reason that tribes can't qualify for um, for funding because of ownership of the land? I'm not sure that I understood that quite. Um, yeah. How this explained. Yeah. So Article 11 Q bonds must be invested in Oregon land and since tribal land is sovereign land then um it doesn't work there um i think also just generally because the state needs to take uh so so we can invest in tribal led projects that are not on tribal land um but generally because the state takes a first lien interest in the land um that's not something that tribes want us to do mm -hmm. um so that is also something that uh you know doesn't doesn't quite work thank you i i agree that that wouldn't quite work but um 
what I will do is some research to see if there is a way to secure the state's interests without um, encumbering the land that's in trust. Thank you. And that's something we can also continue since we're having these ongoing conversations about the guidelines of the program with our Department of Justice, we can also continue to explore with them as well. But I'd be if you if you find anything, we'd love to know. <laughs> Yeah, Chair Hall, if I might ju just say, sure. uh, Council Member uh, Defentorm, I think is raising a really important uh, something to dig into. And I would just say, uh, I'm sure our Department of Justice partners are probably on the line listening since we're engaged in it. Uh, I think, uh, why don't we just add that, uh, Talia, to an express question to Department of Justice to request a response and um, elaboration on just so that we can build our own consciousness around it. And then I would offer both to specifically Council Member Defentorm when we get that um, explanation and clarity back from Department of Justice, I think that's something that actually may be of a lot of shared value, I think, for the Council to have not only understanding on, but then also figuring out of all the number of things that we are doing differently and evolving and changing, what is our room and agency to uh, also shift uh, as well. So we can uh, take that back as an action item um, at your direction. I, I appreciate that, Director Bell. We do use a number of loan products on tribal land without having to encumber the land specifically. So I, I think there are mechanisms around that, although I won't um, speak to bond measure Q. I, I'm not real familiar with that, but I'm, I'm familiar with how we do mortgage lending, et cetera, on tribal land. So thank you. Thank you for raising the issue, Talia. Okay. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Chair Hall. <clears throat> uh, let me third this idea that we need to educate ourselves about this issue. It uh, appears to be uh, unjustly penalizing uh, sovereign tribal nations, <laughs> and that is no one's intent here. So I appreciate the uh, Kamuna staff to uh, investigate so that we can educate ourselves and then figure out the problem solving uh, that we need to do that. I had a question, uh, which uh, Talia was your last question. Does the council want or need us to come back? I think that is a, a question that goes to what is our statutory responsibility as the council. If we have to approve these frameworks, then I think they have to come back. If we don't have to approve these frameworks and staff would like us to, uh, I just need to understand that. But I don't think I can answer that. I think that's a, you know, what are the legal requirements and responsibilities um, of the council? And then in general, uh, again, Talia, maybe in this in this space of trying to have a conversation, do you feel like the changes that we're making here are going to get us closer? to our stated policy interests and goals, and particularly as it relates to uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color home ownership. Uh, you know, I get the, the perspective of where many people are not interested in a land um, banking situation. On the other hand, some are. And again, if this is not a practice or approach that is one that uh, responds particularly to people of color seeking home ownership, then we need to figure out what would be more acceptable, what would be more appropriate, and begin to figure out the advocacy that would have to happen to go back to the legislature around these funds, particularly in, our, in support of our values and where we need to go with this. So uh, I'm curious to hear a little more about are we, you know, we're, we're confident these things are going to get us towards there. We've gotten this feedback. What are we doing? You know, I think it's incumbent upon us to think about, you know, sort of like people raise the issue, give us the feedback and we go, yeah, but the, you know, the funding pr uh, prohibits it, particularly as it relates to communities of color. I think we can't simply ex accept without challenge legislation says this, so we got to do it. I think we need to figure out how we need to go back to the legislature there and said, this doesn't work for these reasons, but here's what might. And I'm very interested in us getting into that kind of forward stance on a number of these issues related to racial justice and equity. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Lee. Any other council members want to weigh in at this moment? So I guess, go ahead. 
Yeah, just for speak, um, responding to the final question about do we want to have uh, an approval of the framework next month? I mean, can we can we answer that question? I don't know that we mm -hmm. need to. So it might just be nice to give them that answer so that they're not trying to figure that out after this meeting. Yep. So is the sense of the council, we would like to see this brought back for approval next month or not? Uh, okay, how about, does anybody have a bur burning desire to have this brought back to us next month? Well, again, Chair Hall, from my perspective, it's not what my personal opinion is. Mm -hmm. It's what we are statutorily required yeah. to do. And okay, I so know. I guess that's the ultimate question. Does this... Does approving this, and I guess I'll look to Director Bell, and she might have to look for other counsel. Is this something that we're part of our statutory responsibilities or optional? Yeah, so Chair Hall, I think there's two things here. So in terms of the statutory authority, we just received the reading back from Department of Justice to the premise of that question. And so I think to be in alignment with that, what feels most prudent is one, to make sure that the council has an opportunity to actually review that and digest that and make sure that <clears throat> make sure that the council is in consensus on that. Uh, so I think that's thing one, just from a factual standpoint on statutory authority. Uh, I think thing two is as part of the initial conversation that we had had around council's role from both a statutory perspective, but then also keeping consistent with uh, bringing items uh, of shared values and proactivity to the council uh, we want to remain consistent at bringing frameworks to the council for visibility, for engagement, and for feedback, even in those instances where it is not a statutory mandate, because that has been uh, the way that we have found that our business is most effective, is when we can bring particularly these frameworks that are of shared values um, in front of the council. So, we have the uh, Department of Justice uh, feedback that we just received. So one, we can get that out. Um, and then I think the other piece of it is we would we intend to remain consistent at bringing frameworks uh, early and often uh, to council. So Talia, if there is not a specific um, uh, time bound nature that we are to, I would wanna make sure that the council can review that uh, statutory reading first prior to uh, voting on that, uh, assuming that our time frames allow for that, which I believe they do. Okay. Councilmember Mania. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, from my perspective, I, I understand definitely would like to know that what our requirements are, uh, legal requirements, but I would love to uh, have a look at the the, the program before he actually goes, uh, just so that we can get kind of the final component and, and, and provide some additional feedback if needed. Okay. So, do we have a path? I think. I'm seeing nods. So, thank you very much, and we'll look forward to continuing to work on uh, these questions and you know part of you know th just this is one more part of making sure I think that our programs applications funding streams are really you know again really we're looking at uh, ways to do an even better job of making sure that we're uh, reaching the people that uh, are really in need of the state's help, our help, everybody's help. So at this point now, I forgot to ask, do we have an item for deep dive discussion today? And Director Bell is nodding. I guess. We do. We okay. Do. So let's get into that. Okay. Oh, oh Council Member Lee. I just wanted to check in about time. Um, uh -huh. We can't deep dive in seven, min seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't want to start something, feel like we're rushed. I also, I have to have a hard stop, you know, that kind of thing. So if we, uh, if we think um, we actually can do it in the time, you know, I mean, that's, 
we were trying to go for an hour, right? And we have mm -hmm. 40, so, or I'm sorry, someone, if someone can do the math on the time, I just want to check on the time before we jump in there to make sure that we have enough time to do the uh, peace justice. Council Member Lee, our adjournment time is set for 1.30. Yes. So I know I said the seven minutes, but and I'm still not sure we have enough time. <laughs> Thank you, Shaloa. You're welcome. So we've got a little over half an hour. So let's give it a try. Um, so happy to give it a try. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Hall. Uh, Executive Director Bell, Council Members. Uh, for the record, my name is Caleb Yan. I'm the Deputy Director. Um, and Council Member Lee, to your your statement there, I, I really, really appreciate it. And I think it actually kind of real will work pretty well because the intent of the deep dive topic today is to 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 preview and to set the stage for what will be another one next month for Housing Stability Council. So this is around uh, 23, 25 readiness and what we're doing by way of process to make sure that we can create implementation plans for what came out of the 2023 legislative session that we could be counted on um, and where we have the agency um, that we really intentionally live our values through that. So the intent for today was to talk through some of the structures and processes that we have created. Um, and uh, next month, we'll be able to actually go through the content, the outcome from, from those processes. So uh, I'll maybe kind of hurry up through the process side of it, um, you know, to, to give at least 20 minutes for any dialogue or feedback from that. Um, so I'm going to share a PowerPoint. And this PowerPoint uh, is intended to just give a little bit of visual for, for uh, the conversation um, and tee up some dialogue. Can you all see? Are you able to see that PowerPoint? Is it? OK, great. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, operational excellence. Uh, let me just go ahead and go right to the, the, the next slide here. But essentially, the one of the reasons we really wanted to bring this as a deep dive topic, it's not something we normally talk about. What are what are the processes and procedures that we have to implement? And frankly, we have never been under the mandate that we have with this budget in this situation to be able to be really clear in when we will be implementing the, the new, the over billion dollars of new investments and a number of policy actions that came out of the legislature and also do it in a way um, that, that aligns with our values, that aligns with the guidance of this council, aligns with the way that we, we want to do business. Um, this kind of was born out of, and I, I, I'll just um, go through a, a couple visuals here in a, in a few minutes. This has been an effort that our internal leadership team has been really focused on for the last couple of years. Um, and so the, the purpose of this is, as you can see on the slide, is really to, to promote a, a priority around accountability to business operations. And, and frankly, one of the things that we talk about a lot is that if we don't prioritize this, nobody else will. The legislature doesn't care about operational plans. You know, the, the stakeholders, all of those pieces, you know, the, you, most of the time that we spend with you all is rightly around the programmatic policies. How do we, how do we make sure that we have the program frameworks and we put this out in the right way? And so this is really trying to focus for us on, we have a lot of aspirations, um, some of which are our aspirations, other of which are aspirations that are handed to us. Um, and how do we make sure that we are able to deliver on those? How do we make sure that our operations are up to speed with those programmatic aspirations? So I'm gonna get into a little bit of uh, insider baseball, just a, a kind of walk you through some of the, the sausage making that you have not been uh, part of the conversations, but but I think it's important for you all to see the work that we have been doing. Um, so as a leadership team, we have what we call SALT, the Strategic Action Leadership Team. And it's at least one time every quarter we get together for a full day 
to focus on, you know, what are the biggest issues that we need to tackle as a leadership team. And for the last two years, this has been a, a, an evolving focus on operations. So really quickly at the kind of the top left of that slide, you could see fall of 2021, that was for the to orient to the time, that was right when the emergency rental assistance program, when the payments had just begun to really start flowing in that. Uh, wildfire recovery had, you know, obviously taken on a, a life of its own landlord compensation. It was a, an inflection point for our agency to say, okay, it's been a crazy couple of years, crazy year. Um, what do we need to focus on? And that time we, we really kind of talked about, well, we're a much bigger agency. We need bigger agencies, processes, bigger agency tools. Um, and then that, you know, moving into spring of 2022, as we started to work on, on some of those items, we, we had another kind of point where we said, well, there are, we're not really a big agency compared to a lot of the ODHS's Department of Human Services or Department of Tran Transportation. And oh, by the way, there are some things about big agencies that we don't actually really like. <laughs> and so what is it that we're really focusing on here? And that's where we kind of pivoted towards um, the, the focus on operational excellence um, and identifying, you know, really clearly that in addition to some of the structures that are in place that don't really focus on operations. It, uh, additionally, in our statewide housing plan, there is no focus on the operational planning within that. Um, it also recognized at that time that, frankly, a lot of the structures that we had in place prior to COVID um, and the concurrent emergencies that we continue to be responsive to as an agency, a lot of us had to just be torn away to be able to match the pace and the speed that was required for the funding for the mandates. And so, and I have mentioned to this council before, over half of our staff started in the last couple of years, right? And so we had also had a whole bunch of new, <laughs> new, new team members and the, the structures that we had in place didn't meet the, the, the moment we were in and in many cases were, were torn, kind of torn away. So that led us to this idea of, uh, a strategy map. Okay, what we're really talking about here is what are the foundational pieces that we need to focus on, a big focus on internal uh, processes and organizational capacity. Um, and so, you know, about a, a December 2022, almost a little less than a year ago, that we, we really focused on that. Um, and then March of this year, as we started to see what was coming out of the, what was likely to come out of the legislative session, we had another moment where we said, we can't do all of these things. What do we really need to focus on here, which is around the 23-25 uh, biennial planning, implementation planning. So that kind of brings us up to June of 2023 on this slide. Um, and I'm gonna advance here to, to uh, walk through some of those kind of processes um, that we have put in place uh, and, then, and then open up to discussion. Uh, so the why behind this is really around, uh, as you can see in the title there, predictable delivery and sustainable workloads. A, a few of the things that we really um, grounded us in why we're doing this is, uh, first of all, as I mentioned at the top, we need to be able to communicate timelines with enough accuracy that we could be counted on to deliver them, right? The, we, there's, you'll see here in a minute, uh, there's 35 unique projects that came out of this legislative session. Natasha dove a little bit in her presentation earlier on, on just one of them, right? Um, but we need to be able to, 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 to forecast and have transparency, and we need to be able to be counted on to, to, imp, to meet those goals, to meet those targets, to meet those plans. In order to do that, we have to build into our cultural fa fabric a system um, that allows internal collaboration. One of the things that we've talked about for the last couple of years, as we've built a project management office and as we have gotten better at um, saying when certain actions will happen is often, particularly for new leaders, we were requiring plans and they've never navigated those systems before. And so it was, uh, 
much like a guess. And so part of this was how do we put the structures in place? So for instance, when we're coming up with an individual procurement plan, we make sure the leaders on procurement and the leaders who are implementing the program have a, a, a really coordinated conversation to co-create these plans um, rather than anything other than that. Um, the next one is around leveraging existing tools. And the last one uh, that I want to elaborate on here is um, we also recognize coming out of this legislative session that there are things that we do not have power to control. There were many things that, you know, the legislation itself said, give this money to this organization for this thing. Um, and, and there are a number of those that, you know, we, we can't take the time to, for instance, uh, use our racial equity analysis tool on implementing because the legislature said, do this, you know, it was very, very prescriptive. And so part of this was to, to be really clear and where do we have decision-making power and where we do, how do we make sure that we infuse our values through the implementation plans that we create for that. Um, and so that's the why. Uh, you can see on this slide the what, uh, I referenced it before, there are 35 individual plans. What you see here, and I'll elaborate on the next slide, is we categorize them into is it full implementation? And that really is the, those places where we, we have some of that decision-making uh, power, or is it really plug and play or program update where it says, just do this thing exactly like you did it before. And based on that, that uh, dictated the processes that we went through. Uh, so you could see uh, here, to, like I said, elaborate on that, the, the what is full implementation, what is plug and play, what is program update. What we did is for all of those, we created critical path um, pipelines. Um, and I'll elaborate that on that in the next slide here. But essentially, we know that everything has to go through a procurement. Uh, almost everything comes to this council. And in, in many cases, we got to hire people to do it. Um, and there has to be administrative rules. Those are things that it is impossible to implement without going through those things. And so how do we make sure in each one of those critical path pipelines that we understand what are the key milestones? What are our service level agreements that how, you know, how the pace by which we can get through them? And how do we make sure that we're able to monitor? Um, and if we're not meeting those milestones, we understand that early so we could course correct, so we could resource it, so we could do those sorts of things. Um, and then for full implementation, it's standards of excellence. So it's a, a place for us to say, um, how do we live our values? What, what are our standards? What would we expect to see? And then let's, let's evaluate our implementation plan against those standards to make sure we're able to live that out in our implementation. Uh, so I, I already referenced this, the, this council rules, hiring, procurement. Um, it is pipelines for every one of those 35 projects where we have kind of time bound dates to say, when is it going to meet, meet each step? Um, and we're able to monitor that. The standards of excellence that I referenced there before um, are listed on this slide. So it starts with, you know, equity and racial justice. And so, you know, just by way of a little more sausage making, uh, each one of these has a, an owner. Um, and that owner really took time to, to, to write out what are the standards related to each of these items that you see on the screen. Um, and then that form was used by each of the project owners to say, okay, here's my implementation plan related to those standards. And then it went back to the owner of that to, to, to look at those responses and to uh, give feedback and, and very specifically green light, kind of yellow light, pause, we need to talk more, or red light, nope, we got a problem here um, and, and we need to change courses. So that's everything from equity and racial justice um, all the way, you can see, to fiscal compliance, IT and accounting to say, are we using a system of record or are we just using spreadsheets? All of those pieces, you know, do we, are, are we ourselves holding, our, holding us to 
um, time bound uh, expenditure plans. What's our spend down plan for this? You know, all of those pieces that we, we need to make sure are infused in those process, processes. So here's where we're at right now. The, uh, you know, kind of non-negotiable is a very strong, strong language there uh, is that by next month uh, in next Housing Stability Council, we're going to bring implementation plans, the content uh, for all 35 projects um, and be able to have a couple different views of it. I'll give a, a quick glimpse at probably what that will look like, but I won't spend much time on it. Um, and that, then, I'll, then I'll be done, but we're going to be externally publishing this plan. So, every, so all of the stakeholders can understand, okay, if I care about this thing and I really wanna engage in rule development, when is it gonna start? When is it gonna end? You know, all of those, those sorts of things. Um, another key to this is that we are able to deliver on these that in a way that is not at the expense of our staff. That's one of the things that we've heard over the last few years is burnout. We have, you know, we're, we're tripled in size. We are, we're continuing to be asked to do things that we've never done before. And so part of the co-creation of plans and really building that our processes to make sure that happens is so somebody doesn't get a surprise and have to work 80 hours a week to deliver on this thing that they had no part in creating. Um, and then the other, the third non-negotiable is, is really, um, infusing a way to live our organizational values through implementation. And importantly, when we know that we cannot do this the way we normally would, we cannot take the time to implement this, we cannot engage with stakeholders the way we normally would, that's understood and we could support each other in operating in those places where we're working under mandates. Uh, so you could see kind of the next steps there uh, we are uh, spent an, uh, an entire day as our leadership team, about 60 of us uh, earlier this week uh, to finalize these, these plans. Uh, we will be reviewing this with the governor. We'll be reviewing this with you all next week or next, I'm sorry, next month. Um, so that's the end. I'm gonna stop sharing here um, and I'll, just very quickly, just do one, one other visual and then uh, open it up to conversation. So this is very drafty draft. Please don't screenshot like these, these, these plans will change, but this is a sense of what you, what the output of this. Can you all see the spreadsheet now? Okay, so it has all of the, the projects listed. It has all of the standards of excellence and the review processes so you could see um, you know, where is it that, that our review teams green, green lit it? Where is it they said, red, red light, we have a problem here. Um, and then we were able to course correct and change those plans. Uh, the out, outcome of that is gonna be something like this. We're gonna have used by project level. So for instance, PSA risk mitigation fund, it came today. We were actually a month early um, ahead of where we expected to be. They expected the briefing to go to council in December. We'd like to see that. That's a good thing. Uh, but it has, you know, the, the NOFA or procurement. When is it going to start? When is it going to be published? The rulemaking process. It has Housing Stability Council. Where, where are we going to engage with you and for what purpose? Um, and then it kind of looks at the different critical paths. So this one is for rulemaking. So all of the projects, when are we gonna start? When are we gonna end based off the type of rules? Same thing for procurement. When is, when is it you know, based off the type and complexity of procurement? When is it going to start and end? And then for you all uh, to be able to, and this one is, is much more like a schedule because it, it's not exactly the same thing where there are key milestones, but being able to publish for you all, here are all the, the projects and here's when we're going to be coming to talk to you about them and for what purpose so is it a briefing and a discussion is it decision uh you know what is the purpose of that engagement so now i will stop sharing and and also stop talking and and again this is supposed to be the intent here is to to give you enough information that that we could be in conversation that we could dialogue um, if there are things that you want to make sure 
our processes and incorporate that either you saw or, or didn't see, that is the type of feedback that is really, really helpful for us. Okay, council, jump in, jump right in, the water's fine. Okay, Council Member Rogers. Thank you for that presentation, Caleb. Really, 35 projects? That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. So um, as far as timing to review all of that, I think for me, it might be helpful, even though I know your Excel um, critical path isn't complete, if you could share that so I could take a deeper dive offline with that, because this is a lot to absorb. Yeah, absolutely, Council Member Rogers. We're refining that now, and the intent is to, it will be in the packet at, ahead of the next meeting. And uh, and certainly, you know, that's not enough time. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that's enough time to absorb it. Um, this is something as part of the frankly accountability around this right and one of the things we 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 talk a lot about this um is is reframing accountability to to be able to count on each other um but this is something we want to regularly come back through monitoring with with the the council to be able to say okay here's here's where we're at here's where things went to plan um here's where things did not go to plan so this is this is intended to be the, the beginning of what will be a durable and uh, you know regular sort of um, tool that we can use as a as as a way to engage with the council, um, and we'll get you it as soon as those final decisions are made. <laughs> right, Council Member Farrell. Just want to commend you for using that strategy. I think it's really clear to see where you're at to catch stuff before it gets too far. Course correct and having that sort of visual is uh, really helpful. So I just want to say, without having spent time really looking at it, just at a first glance, like I, that's an awesome tool. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to understand more. Hey, Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Chair Hall. Uh, I will also add my appreciation for the information and for the effort, right? And we've had, we've had a lot of conversation about what does it take to, to try to become the organization that can respond in, in these ways to these things. Um, you know, I'm thinking a couple of things. I think there is a danger for uh, us as the council to get too far in the weeds, right? We, and so this is still part of us figuring out what's, you know, what's the role of the council. It, you know, on some level it's, we should know that these systems are in place and that you all are managing and using them as tools in the work. We shouldn't get into the level of, did you do it this way? Did you do it that way? Those kinds of things. So I, I think about that. Um, I also think about uh, for next month, even trying to, you know, even when you get it all together and we get it in the book and, and all of that kind of stuff, I wonder if we couldn't be selective about sort of the highlights that you think that either particularly illustrate a success or a challenge or a piece that the uh, you know, it's really super germane to the council's understanding because I worry, I mean, my eyes will go to the details as well and go, oh, well, that should that be red or all the red ones are things I should be worried about. We're not managing the organization. You are. Um, you're leading the organization. We should be working with you around the policy issues. So I just, um, I'm curious about that. I don't know where that line is or where that spot is with all of us. And, and I know uh, I can have a tendency to go to the details when it's not my job to go to the details, right? It's my job to have a relationship with you all as leadership to uh, offer the policy advice I've been asked to give and then, you know, suggestions if you want them, but not to go to the details. Um, and then I'm also, and this is again, I think all of us here, uh, we like and likely won't have a time to talk about this. Uh, when do we push back? When do we say, no, governor, legislature, you cannot have 
35 new projects of varying blah, 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 blah. And they all need to be done at the same time in the same timeline with the same exact resources we have in terms of staff capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I get it. None of us, there are funders, <laughs> there are bosses in essence. Uh, and at some point we have, and I go back to some of the values, Caleb, that you expressed in, in this presentation, um, making sure that these things don't end up on staff means sometimes we have to tell people no. And I get it. I'm not trying to be naive of like, oh, we'll just tell them no. And they'll say, yes, take another year. However, <laughs> I feel like for the council, we've got to figure out a ways in which we say no, maybe if the organization can't say no, and I don't say, and I'm not meaning no, like we won't do it, stamp the foot. It's okay, I hear what you're saying, and you got to know that that's not reasonable. And when you come back afterwards, in hindsight, to say, you asked them to do this, they did this, and now you're grumpy with how uh, the work was done, that's not okay, that's not cool. So you know, where are our um, boundaries, you know, individually and collectively on this? And, you know, how do we do sort of the both and of like, okay, we're going to try our best, as staff always do, to, you know, successfully navigate what's been put in front of them, and also say, this is unreasonable. And, you know, Caleb, I, you, you were just, uh, I think, being completely uh, present. We, there should never, ever, ever be a moment where we say, we don't have enough time to pay attention to racial justice and equity, period. And if someone is asking us to do that, we should loudly, clearly, and strongly say, absolutely not. You don't get to tell us that. And in order to do this, this must happen and you gotta slow down. I mean, if we don't stand on our racial justice and equity goals, we're not standing on anything. We have to be able to uh, push back on these things and, um, I know it's a you're in a rock and a hard place, right? Because the funding's there. If you don't take it, you're going to get criticism there. You don't get an out and up in the time that somebody thought you're going to get criticism there. However, what's our place, right? Together with the council, what's our place? What are we standing on? And when do we say no, 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 no? If you require this such that we cannot do that, we're out. Yeah, Chair Hall, if I may. Um... Yes. This is, I, first off, let me just say, I so appreciate us making the time and the council making the time to prioritize this conversation. Um, and I know you will continue to give us feedback around how we engage and approach this, but I think it is these types of conversations that are quite frankly, it is, you know, high self to high self conversations, really thinking about strategically around how we uh, best use our time, efforts, expertise uh, forward on the things of highest impact with acknowledgement that it won't be everything. And so I just appreciate uh, uh, all, of, all of the conversation and, and feedback. For just a moment, I guess just a couple of reflections, they're not intended to be answers, but just a couple of reflections here. Part of the intention on why I wanted to really bring this to council for just a moment um, was to briefly take the altitude a little bit deep with the commitment that we're gonna bring you right back up. And a, a, a piece of that is, I think my own reflection has been oftentimes, and I, I, I will take ownership for this, not staff or, le or any other leaders here, that oftentimes we're bringing pr very major substantive things mm -hmm. without really talking through the surface level, the, the deeper surface level area of what it even takes mm -hmm. to get up to that point or other contours of things that we're navigating or we're, look we're bringing you something and it is as, as important as it is it may be my myop myopic or agnostic of all the other things. For just a moment, I want to make sure that we are, I am doing my piece. If we're really saying partnership and team, that we resource you for a moment to just sort of see underneath the surface the whole thing and then come back up for a moment. So we promise we will not. Um, uh, we, we, we will not have you there uh, uh, from a sustainable um, perspective. So that's thing one. I think the other piece of this is the timing of this is, is advantageous in that we are seeking um, and receiving feedback and information from the Department of Justice as it pertains to the statutory role of counsel, not in theory, but in practice. And so resourcing you all with that factual information while also having access to 
the full picture of what the what the agency has in front of us and what we're navigating and what we need to accomplish and get done, I think allows us to collectively look at both. Um, uh, it allows us, I th hopefully, to look at all of that information and discern together what is the best use of our time together, what is highest and best use of the things that we bring to council based on, yes, uh, informed by the statutory roles, but if the council says, well, the statute doesn't govern that we need to bring this thing as a voting thing, but this is big and substantive enough or reflective of one of the areas where we want to move and see progress, so bring that to us, then we can have some shared working agreements about not just the volume of things of coming, but the actual value and the utility of them based on whatever criteria criteria we, we set together. That's a thing too. I think the other piece of it too, uh, and I'll wrap up my comments here, uh, Chair Hall, and yield back to you is also um, so that the council has a greater awareness of the extent of the pivots that staff are having to make right now. And it's, you know, all in uh, the name of progress and progress for the people that we serve, progress to in a very real way uh, for folks that are uh, struggling to get by, that are waking up with the stressors every single day around rent and a place to live. I think for those of us that have been there know that that is an, an untenable stressor to live with every single day. And so we also wanna make sure that folks know what's happening, how staff are having to, to mold and change and evolve and stretch to do all of these things and we can do all of these things. And um, we are not getting to the finish line on the backs of our folks. We want to take care and take well in the process as well in that. And so in order to do that, we sort of need to be able to unearth um, and have a few clunky conversations so that we can resource ourselves to have the right altitude of conversations in a way that is reflective of quite frankly, the really big swing opportunities that we have in front of us right now. And I think many of us are, we see some really major opportunities to take some big swings at progress and we're gonna caffeinate ourselves and we're just gonna just keep swinging, keep hitting. And we also know that uh, the girth of that isn't sustainable uh, large scale either. And so my hope is that this will one, be the start of the conversation and that we will have some factual information and de enough detail uh, to chart our course together as well. Uh, and I think Caleb mentioned it, but I think it just bears repeating one of the mandates that I heard uh, by far from uh, the folks of the agency who I am also committed to and need to be responsive to their needs was around clarity, empowerment to make decisions and sustainable workloads. And that is one of Caleb's mandates as the deputy director is to make sure that we have a very clear course of action to get there and we aren't feeding people nice words um, and the reality isn't shifting. And so this is a piece of that, which is it's very challenging, if not impossible to get to sustainable workloads um, if uh, leadership can't share in the power in decision-making, just to be really frank, if we're not willing to let go of some things and let our really smart folks make decisions, uh, if we can't wrestle with the realities of the varying opportunities of what it looks like to be here based on race and based on experience, we need to wrestle with that, but also that it is nearly impossible to achieve, really achieve sustainable workloads if we have no clue about what's coming. And there, um, we are not resourcing the entirety of the agency around what we are all having to contend with and keeping that in, in a vacuum. So out of respect and understanding that we're on this journey and the council's on this journey with us, we wanna make sure that you can see the full picture and then together we can chart out how to best use our time together uh, at your direction and in pursuit of the shared progress that I know we're all after. Thank you, Director Bell. Um, anybody else? I don't wanna cut this off prematurely. We are coming right up to our scheduled adjournment time, but uh, just if somebody has a final burning, blossoming, whatever you want to call it, kind of a thought, uh, uh, an itch that needs scratching. Ah, where am I going with this? Anyway, no. Oh, okay. Council Member Meehan. Today is my first day. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Chair Hall. Thank you, um, Caleb, uh, and council members for allowing us to be in this space. And uh, hey, by frankly, just being straight honest with me, you know, uh, this is what it is. And, and it really is dollars and cents. And um, I will have to uh, back up my, my fellow council member, uh, Council Lee, member Lee, that, you know, I will not sacrifice racial and uh, equitable justice for anything. Uh, however, I do um, also echo with uh, uh, Director Bell that, you know, we I understand. And um, wow, we did get us our feet wet here. So thank you yeah. very much. And, and I do appreciate uh, the information and, and uh, your presentation. And I did take screenshots. So I'd love to have uh, a little mm -hmm. more visual before I make decisions next month. <laughs> That's great. Again, thank you. Welcome to you, Council Member Harris, Council Member Rodriguez. I think we're just thrilled to have you on board. As you can see, this council has a lot, and I do mean a lot of business and a lot of very important business. So the larger and stronger the team, the better. Again, thank you all. We're right at adjournment time, so I think that's a good moment to wrap things up. We will see you next month. My gosh, after Thanksgiving and... Uh, just about three weeks from Christmas. So again, thank you all for today. We'll look forward to seeing you again really soon. We're adjourned.